Welcome back once again to a DF Retro Conference Retrospective. We've done this before for PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the like, but it is time, at last, to tackle PlayStation 4. The current generation. This is the beginning of the current console generation, uh, and we are just on the cusp of the beginning of the next, right now as we record this. And as always, to discuss this uh, event, the proceedings here, I'm joined by two of my good friends, Richard. Hello there, John. And Alex. Hey there, John and Richard. So, yeah, this is it, guys. We've been talking about this for a bit. It is time to tackle the current generation of consoles now that the it's on the way out, I suppose. So we're starting at the beginning. Yeah. We do, yeah. And um, we're kicking off with three and a half minutes of nonsense, I think, basically. Um, <laughs> where it's just well, kind of like a retrospective, I think, on what they've done on the prior PlayStation generations. I can see what you mean, that it's like nonsense, but in reality, I think it's kind of a smart thing because this is the first glimpse of next gen, and what Sony's doing here is just trying to tap into that nostalgia for the PlayStation brand. Like, they start to reference, you know, there's original PlayStation, PlayStation 2 stuff, uh, PlayStation 3, of course, and all the marketing stuff around that. It's just kind of a reflect reflection back on what had come before, which, you know, it's, it's a bit cheesy, I suppose, but... I think it works. Like PS9 right there. You saw that. <laughs> I think it would just be less cheesy if they didn't have the non sequitur words like in front of everything. But <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I have some of these games I actually do have uh, good fond memories of and others less so. So it's kind of funny. It's, they do go through like the, the breadth of everyone who's played PlayStation games, like different genres and things like that. But I think at the conference themselves here or at this announcement, um, they don't actually show a huge breadth of genre of games. It's This is more about the first time showing PlayStation 4 and what its power can achieve. Uh, yeah, and I think actually this, this, as we'll see, I still think that this is a really great way to reveal the system. Mm -hmm. And unlike what they did with PlayStation 3, well, it's a little bit more realistic overall. I'd say that the quality of the presentation is certainly uh, ratcheted up, certainly from uh, what we saw with PlayStation 3. But it's kind of just three and a half minutes of nonsense. Nothing actually happens. It's just friction, I think. People want to see what's happening here, not kind of a big hurrah of what we've already done. And, uh, you know, PS3 was a bit of a mixed sort of era for the PlayStation uh, brand, I think. I think, actually, the stumbles of PS3 kind of helped them here because it started off with issues for sure but then by the end of the ps3 generation they sort of recaptured you know the essence of playstation and by going into the next generation it was take basically applying the lessons they learned during the previous generation uh and bringing that momentum to the next and i think that really worked well Ooh, here. andrew house yeah i mean playstation 3 was kind of like i guess xbox 360 as well was the first generation of uh, console box that would do more than just play your games in a certain sense of the word and i think that's something that andrew house talks about here where you could use it for multimedia you, you know you plug in your blu-rays buy a separate hd dvd <laughs> uh, thing for your xbox 360 which will or not never use again you know you you know you can use the box for more than that and they talk about this at the at the beginning of this playstation 4 reveal because i think actually up until this point in the generation you know, PS3 was lagging behind up until the very end when it started to overtake and actually become the real competitor to the Xbox 360, at least in the Western uh, part of the world. Um, but this demonstration isn't, I mean, I don't think it actually fa focuses too much on multimedia usage of the PlayStation 4. Uh, it's just really about what is this thing? What does it do? And I think that's why I, like you, John, I actually really like this. Yeah. I was pretty hyped. I was reading, you know, next generation speculation threads at this time. We thought we knew what we would be seeing here. And I still, I was still surprised by a number of aspects. Yeah, I think it's worth bearing in mind that the specs had effectively leaks at this point. There was that massive um, hack 
uh, the full extent of which wasn't revealed until many years later. But the specs were out there, or at least the specs that had actually been shared more generally. So there are a couple of surprises here, a couple of big ones. <laughs> so it's an interesting thing, actually, for me, kind of before they get into the meat here. Uh, this is obviously at the cusp of the current generation when it was brand new, but it was also kind of a shift for my own life personally, because this thing aired just as I had packed up our house uh, to move to Europe. So it was kind of like closing the chapter. I had done like IT uh, in the auto industry for like a decade at that point. And I left all that behind, took everything and moved to Europe. And then the next generation started. And that's also when I started working with you, Richard. Oh, yes. uh, it was the beginning of the current run. So it's been, it basically started with this current generation for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a really exciting time when you're actually there. I mean, I wasn't actually at this particular conference, so I was uh, kind of in the same position as you guys. Um, Just watching uh, from afar. Watching from <laughs> afar and um, kind of curious to, to, to see what Sony had lined up for us because, you know, there was a lot of uh, information out there. We knew about the architecture of the machine, but we didn't really know how it was going to be used. Only v vague hints about what the games would actually be like. Uh, lots of leaks. Uh, I mean, the Xbox power differential was known by then. Um, so, you know, that was kind of uh, interesting because on paper, the gap looked ginormous. And just about the only thing that the yeah. um, the, the Xbox had going for it was uh, the extra memory uh, versus the PS4. This, the leaks were suggesting that the Xbox had eight gigabytes of memory versus the PS4 with four. And obviously <laughs> this, <laughs> this conference turned things on its head somewhat. Uh, I mean, I'm just sort of talking generally here because, you know, I'll tell you what, I, you guys know when I speak to you about your intros that I hate friction. I just want to get get to the point. Yes. You know, he's not yeah. actually saying See, anything of any consequence here whatsoever. So I think you're right, but Andrew's doing he's just doing his business spiel. But this is like the time to do it because he knows. Oh yeah. People watching this are waiting, right? Like he can take all the time in the world here <laughs> to say whatever he wants to say, and people are going to be hanging on to it. They want to see what's next and. <laughs> So I guarantee that that's part of it. It's like, let me just set the stage here for you for about 10 minutes. That's what he's doing. He, I swear at one point he does mention Vita here. Um, he might have actually already mentioned it uh, while I was listening to Richard speak. Um, but this, at what point in the Vita's lifespan is this uh, actually? This was this was basically a year after it launched in the West. Yeah, right? That's crazy. So Vita was still new, and I was a big fan of the Vita, in fact. So yeah. Um, uh, so we needed to see some synergies there, didn't we? Because um, we, we kind of wanted more from our Vitas at that point. And the mm -hmm. hope was uh, we kind of knew, I think, about Gaikai at this point. We knew about the idea of remote play. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the big dream was always that Vita would be like a gamepad uh, for PS4 in the same way that the gamepad was a gamepad for the Wii yeah, U. Right. That didn't quite pan out. Um, but we do well, actually, actually that's, that's, we do actually see it being demonstrated. If you go back to this time period, do you guys remember the second sc screen experience? Yeah, it's all over this presentation. I mean, that was the thing, right? Like everybody was about that. I think 2013 was the first time I ever went to a game event. I went to Gamescom 2013. It was the first time I actually went to one of these shows. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in on various demos. You know, it's exciting. It's my first time at one of these things. And almost every single thing that I looked at, the developers were so excited to bring out like an iPad or a phone and be like, we got, you know, if you want to see people racing around the track, you can watch them on your phone. Look <laughs> at like, this. Okay. I'm just like, if you click on their car in the map, you can do things to them. <laughs> and I'm just like, um, this is this is actually not very interesting. And this is, you're right. You, you mentioned the Wii U gamepad and the Wii U was only like... Uh, it had come out in just a couple months or three months before yeah, this right? conference. Mm -hmm. Come on now, Wii. <laughs> so the Wii U was <laughs> the Wii U was brand new. I know. I'm I'm really happy that that isn't such a big thing or ended up not being such a big thing this generation because that means we would have to in our videos look at second screen experience features and see if they reduce performance or something like that. Imagine horrible 
videos we'd have to make with that. Um, I'm happy that didn't catch on. I do. I'd rather not. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I do remember the initial showing of uh, the division where they also showed off, or well, it was the, maybe the second showing of division where they showed off uh, second screen features where you can control the bots in the game uh, with the second screen, which I don't even think it actually ended up being in the final game. I, I honestly don't remember. You see, nobody really sort of thought this through. I've got one pair of eyes and I can look at one screen at a time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that fundamentally was one of my issues with Wii U. Yeah. Like you'd play a game like Rayman Legends, fantastic game, right? Oh, it's but, so good. But there's yeah. these levels where you have to use the touchscreen to navigate it. That's fun. I, I like the idea. Problem is, now you're stuck looking at that very low quality uh, touchscreen, yeah. right? You have this beautiful large HD TV in front of you, but no, you have to look down at this awful LCD that's like 480p resolution. Yeah, um, that was so weird. It, it's just, I actually didn't like taking my eyes off the main screen to look at that thing because it just felt like, I don't know, it, it didn't work for me. I mean, Xbox got there first with smart glass. That's true. <laughs> for Xbox 360. Smart glass. <laughs> smart glass. <laughs> We're just kind of like going on about this stuff now because Andrew House here, he... He is doing... Wait. Oh, but Mark's coming wait, up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here he goes. Here he goes. Here we go. Here we go. Just as I say that. This is great, though. Um, Have you guys watched the uh, Mark Cerny ASMR videos? <laughs> those, those are pretty great. There will be lots of chances later on this year to look at the PlayStation 5 games. Today, I want to talk a bit about our goals for the PlayStation 5 hardware and how they influenced the development of the console. Thank you, Andy. I like the way he creeps up behind him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I, th I think it has to be said that Mark did a tremendous job oh, here at the show. Like this was one of the first like big forward-facing on-stage presentations that he'd done like this, and he's been in the industry forever. Mm -hmm. Like he goes back a long way, but his presentation here. The calm method in which he presents all these details to the audience in such a structured way, I think, is really interesting and uh, expertly. I done. also do enjoy that he's not reading. Uh, it doesn't look like he's reading from a teleprompter, and he actually does uh, mess up his wording occasionally uh, when he's just talking because he's talking passionately from himself as the system architect. Yeah, I think he is. I think he is reading from a teleprompter. I'll be honest with you. I think he is reading from a teleprompter. Oh, is he? Um, yeah, because um, there's the thing coming up a bit later with the sucker punch guy, where his entire delivery is nerfed. <laughs> well, <laughs> it could be some. Sometimes I use like a teleprompter in a video where I just have like kind of a rough uh, sort of you know, writing about what I'm going to do. Right, it's like an outline mm. basically, and I just kind of speak using the outline and let the teleprompter go. And it's a great way to kind of keep you on track mm -hmm. if you don't want to directly read from it. Yeah, I mean, if you're in command of the detail, essentially you just need some bullet points and off you go. Exactly. And you can actually see that he's looking down here at the, uh, presumably, where those screens are. Oh, that's a good point. A yeah, now point. I see it. Yeah. You see? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is a really good presentation and he does actually have presentational skills, which is uh, quite rare for yeah. uh, a, a technical guy. And he is basically... He does have the audience in the palm of his hand at this point because he's he mentions the magic word at some point which is specs which is kind of what everybody had been waiting for well yeah what what i like i like what he's doing here though where he's basically he's basically standing there reflecting back on the last generation and saying okay here's what we've noticed that worked and this is you know kind of where we want to expand you know what i mean it's a great way of setting up uh what's to come he really mentions there the kind of like exotic design of the playstation 3 might have you know given it the longevity that it had but ps4 is orientated around being much more easy to develop for uh much you know specs that people can take advantage of rather quickly in comparison to the ps3 exactly yeah. well, what he's actually talking the about, time to triangle what he's actually talking about is almost a complete rejection of the traditional console architecture that's based on exotic bespoke components mm -hmm. you know he basically yeah. says this is not what developers want they want to have something that they're familiar with that they can get um, maximum results from with the easiest effort which is kind of the antithesis of PlayStation 3, and uh, obviously, if it's we the look back... the antithesis of Kudaragi, I'd yeah, say. Definitely. Well, exactly, yeah. And uh, obviously, one thing which wasn't widely known at that point was that this wasn't Cerny's first console project. 
uh, as it was presented right. to the public. He had actually executed PlayStation Vita as lead system architect by this point, which follows much the same um, sort of philosophy that underpins PlayStation 4, which is that there Absolutely. isn't sort of crazy hardware going on here. It's effectively customized uh, versions of off-the-shelf components, mm. but you just get maximum return from it with you know minimal effort. So mm, yeah, yeah I mean right. obviously it what it works, and uh, this is this is effectively what he's talking about now. Uh, the question from uh, my perspective, obviously I've been listening to you guys and talking. Has he mentioned yet the uh, dynamic preference-driven path through the world of content? <laughs> <laughs> It may have happened uh, when I was talking. Uh, <laughs> Which is just awesome. A dynamic, preference-driven path through the Don't world of content. I, think, <laughs> I, I love that. I think what he means oh, is, uh, basically, oh. you can select so, things on a menu. So, yeah. the one thing I do want to... Oh, gosh. There's a lot to talk about here. There we go. It's okay. We got yeah, time. Um, <laughs> obviously... There's a lot to say here. I think the big point though is like later on as we'd see after these consoles come out that supercharged PC architecture uh, I think is in reference mainly to the memory subsystem and how it interacts with like the GPU and the CPU. I don't think it's actually in reference to uh, the power of this thing like supercharged in that way. It's just you can easily access yeah. RAM. Uh, that's what I think what it was about. Uh, obviously, after the fact, if you look at Jaguar and its performance across the generation in both consoles, it sounds really silly to call it supercharged, but that's actually a very important part. Uh, the PS3 had unified memory, you know, you could access it. I, I mean, sorry, the PS3 had uh, split memory and you couldn't split you memory, couldn't access yeah. um, them both uh, for, for, you know, for they had to be used for dedicated processes and people were always running into RAM problems on the PS3. PS4, orientated around a developer, you don't have that problem. Well, speaking of RAM, we've just missed oh, the gigaton, yeah. which was the eight gigs of memory confirmed, which, you know, from what I understand, caused collective dismay at Microsoft at that point, because that was their <laughs> I'm sure. one advantage that they thought they had banks against PlayStation 4 there. And, you know, he, you, you can see that Sony literally is emphasizing the mm -hmm. eight gigabytes proudly announce that we're going to have eight gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. Yeah. So at a, at a stroke, they've eliminated Microsoft's uh, storage yeah, advantage. Yeah, uh, memory advantage. But, and you know, they're using GDDR5, so they've got a huge yes. bandwidth advantage as oh. well. Yeah, um, that was a huge deal. Mm. I'm sure that stems from them speaking with developers, and I'm sure many developers were quite frank with Sony at that point that four gigabytes is not going to cut no, it. No, not at all. So, no. Well, I did ask Mark about that, and he did say that it was changed due to developer feedback. I'm not sure when it was changed, because um, I think I saw the, the, the documents from Sony maybe in December, a couple of months before this, definitely said four gigabytes of memory on there. Oh, wow. Uh, so, you know, whether that was actually oh. going to be... Uh, um, so we've already missed a cut. So yeah. he just revealed the new controller, which we'll talk about, I guess, more in a moment. But now he's showing uh, this the Unreal Engine 4 tech demo running on PS4. Yeah, now. this is interesting, mm -hmm. you know, because like Unreal Engine 4 before this came out had already shown off this tech demo, though, with a different technological basis. It was using, you know, um, foggy lighting. So it was, uh, voxelized tracing, essentially, which gave global illumination. Yeah. This we didn't know at the time, obviously, but that version of the demo is not using this very expensive technology, uh, which Epic had to call from the engine to kind of make it work with next generation technology at all, like next gen consoles, or even I would say GPUs for that time. Yeah. Another important point here is that was a live demo. It was running in real time on uh, PS4 yeah, hardware. Yeah. He was using the touchpad to, to change the viewpoint a little bit. This is something that really annoys me about kind of modern day uh, reveals all canned footage, barely anything running in real time uh, on stage, mm -hmm. you know, with the with the presenter able to dynamically interact with it. This is hugely important. And this whole transition to canned trailers, you know, really does make me few. I, I kind of get it, though, in the sense that it is difficult to ensure that that everything goes off without <laughs> a hitch. But I guess that's why you have a backup video just in case. And then there's things like latency 
uh, that happens when you're projecting to these large displays. And, yeah. But I think it's worth it in the end. It, it creates something that's more compelling for the viewer. Mm -hmm. so, so here he's demonstrating that the GPU can yeah. actually use do a lot of CPU, yeah. uh, traditionally CPU-driven tasks. And this is another thing I really like, tech demos. Show what your system's capable yeah, of. Yeah, those, those are I great. Like, I like and, that too, you know, they're rare. It <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to be gameplay to get the point across. You know, this is what I really like about it. I mean, that used that. to be, that's how PlayStation was always revealed in the past, yeah. with tons of tech demos. Exactly. I wonder if they're going to do it again for the PS5 real reveal, beyond what we saw with Unreal Engine 5. I wonder if they're just going to show off games. I doubt yeah. it. Uh, no, knowing about the current leadership and the way they approach things, um, I suspect not. Oh, 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 wait. Yeah. Here we go. This is the moment. The first, <laughs> the first showcase of a PlayStation 4 game. Uh, it's Knack from Mark Cerny. And I've always had an issue with this reveal, only in the sense that what they're showing right now is all video. Oh, yeah. is it? Like in the game, like this is not real time graphics. Oh, yeah. Like all the cutscene, all the cutscenes were pre renders. That explains a lot. <laughs> um, I actually do remember thinking this looked pretty good for the time. I mean, art style aside, anyone can talk about that uh, for hours. Uh, but I do remember thinking, oh, this is like another jump, to, uh, jump towards pre-rendered, uh, you know, CGI graphics. But in the end, this is literally just pre-rendered. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So yeah, it's a little bit disappointing in that sense. I mean, I guess yeah, some of this stuff. Like that's probably like there's a few shots here that could conceivably have been the real time graphics. Yeah, uh, but you don't have a big big love for the first game, John, right? Due to its unlocked frame I rate. I don't. Oh, I mean, I don't like the way it runs. It's bad performance. But didn't it was a really, didn't you really actually say title. to Mark Sony at Gamescom that you don't like the way the frame rate <laughs> presents in back? No, in my in my younger days when I was bold, the, that same first Gamescom, yes, I did specifically call him out on it, and, and we went back and forth a little bit. Uh, I mean, what I, was I, his reasoning for an unlocked frame rate? His reasoning was, you know, oh, the faster, you know, if you the more frame rate you have, essentially it improves the responsiveness on the controller, uh, and I'm thinking like. Dude, the game is like it's like 35 <laughs> FPS most of the time at best. It, that doesn't make a difference. I know, right? It just looks jerky to and the that's eye. It's just also inconsistent too, you know? Like it's And I think I was just asking more like would you consider perhaps a frame rate cap option? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is the name? So come I've from? got to admit, well, who knows and who cares, but fundamentally I I <laughs> this is our first look at um PlayStation 4 mm -hmm. and um it wasn't what I was expecting, and I was kind of no. underwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could see that that there was something to it, but you know, what what were we looking at there? This is the other thing, you know, you know pre uh, canned trailers. You never know what you're looking at. You never really know: is it real time? Is it a cinematic? Exactly. And this That's is a, a classic example here. Now we know pretty much that that was a cinematic because we do actually get a bit of gameplay in a moment here, mm -hmm. and it looks nothing like what we just saw. So <laughs> what is the point of that trailer? Oh. I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan as well either. Consumer oriented. Yeah, that's just you know. <laughs> you know, one thing I want to talk about that he mentioned earlier was he mentioned um, kind of ease of development. Uh, and spanning over a long period of time so that it could be unlocked more potential. Oh, yeah. So there's two parts of that that I think are interesting. One is that GCN as an architecture, the one that's driving the GPU from AMD, uh, kind of has problems, I would say, with utilization at this point in time. And so to get a lot of that compute power out of it, you have to use asynchronous compute. You have to move all of your, you know, like... Um, effects work over to compute and not like typical pixel shaders or maybe vertex shaders and things like that. And that took actually a quite a bit of time, uh, I think, when this generation yeah. started for people to get used to that, developers. So that's why at the beginning of this generation, we had things like the, what is it, the GTX 750Ti or whatever it is, um, that GPU from NVIDIA that, Rich, you used to put against, um, you know, the PlayStation 4. Yeah, and, and it always did well. Yeah, right? Um, well, here's the thing. I mean, uh, again, this is something that uh, Mark Cerny uh, took me to task over when I spoke to him um, about PS4 Pro, I think, where he didn't like the concept of his GPU being compared to an equivalent PC part. First of all, he thought that 
even though the PC part hit the market first, it was so long in development for Sony that it was, you know, just as much a Sony innovation as it was an AMD innovation. And um, huh. yeah, so so yeah, basically he's, he wasn't happy about us comparing uh, a PC part to his console part. But, you know, looking back, it is effectively the low level access that really does give PS4 the edge, really. And they did double up on the uh, compute pipelines, the ACEs. Yeah, there is that. And I think beyond just, you know, that element, there's also just the fact that so many new techniques had been discovered there was a lot of innovation completely in, uh, 3d rendering this generation yeah. like so many new things that just didn't exist in 2013 designed to squeeze the most out of these machines it's really tremendous and i think you know it's a real fun kind of experiment to go back and look at some of the earliest games like if you compare call of duty ghosts to modern warfare 2019 yeah, it's a big difference <laughs> and you see like the gulf in rendering quality and performance uh, it really showcases, you know, the vast difference between them. And a lot of it just comes down to these developer innovations and tricks and optimizations well, and all that I'll tell stuff. you what. All the things that they had learned. If you compare Ghosts to Advanced Warfare, which was like oh, yeah. the following year, yeah, that, right. was, that was a huge Already jump. Already elite. Yeah, yeah, I spoke to uh, the technical director of Infinity Ward, and apparently a lot of the innovations that we saw in Advanced Warfare, they were ready for Ghosts, but... The development time simply wasn't there to utilize them. Oh, what a shame. Oh, see, it's a shame. Yeah, but, you know, Advanced Warfare really was a big leap for, for Call of Duty, and that was in the space of a year. But you're right, when, you, when you look at what Modern Warfare 2019 is doing now on the same piece of hardware, it's, yeah, right. uh, it's, it is a generation it's leap. Yeah. Just even also, like, evolutions within the same usage of technology. Like, Modern Warfare 2019 uses uh, tessellation. You know, you can see it like if you get up to like cylinders and stuff like that, or like uh, blocks of concrete. It, that was like the big point about Call of Duty Ghosts is that they used tessellation, but they kind of like overused it everywhere. Uh, you know, like new technology that was used kind of rudimentarily versus, I would say, a more refined usage of it. The places where it matters later in the generation too. Yeah, and just things like the the way they handle lighting yeah, right? and indirect lighting and the anti-aliasing methods. You know, using temporal solutions and all these things that just contributed to a much cleaner smoother more natural looking image and world like th that stuff just wasn't there in 2013 yeah right you know i'm just thinking about it. eight gigabytes of dddr uh gddr5 uh that was like only like a couple days after this was announced uh there was the first titan uh nvidia card with six gigabytes uh, and that thing was like, what, a thousand US dollars when it came out? <laughs> um, yeah, and nothing used it. Nothing yeah. used it until, yeah, nothing. Uh, wasn't it like the first uh, Middle Earth game? Yeah, right. Uh, that came Maybe out that's it. That, actually, that actually used six gigabytes of, of VRAM on the PC space. But, you know, oh, if, yeah. if you look at the console generation, having that 16 times multiplier of memory over the last generation has been so crucial to the success of it in my opinion oh yeah and completely. going for eight gigs here it really was um uh, a very forward-looking decision that, that would have cost them like hundreds of millions if not more yeah right but still there it is i mean i did hear a rumor that um uh playstation 4 was going to ship with the camera just like xbox was Oh. And, oh, okay. And um, the kind of decision was at the corporate level that they would ditch the camera, make it a peripheral, and then shift the the money that they clawed back into paying for the extra memory. And if that is the case, that is wow. probably one of the, the greatest <laughs> decisions <laughs> of this console generation. Yeah. Decision making. So one thing we didn't get to talk about earlier uh, was when they revealed the DualShock mm -hmm. Four which I think is a really important thing to discuss in the sense that this was the first time uh, in a long time that Sony really redefined what their controller looks like while adding some new functionality to it. And it was a huge step from the DualShock of old, I'd mm -hmm. say. That light bar, basically, is that what you're mentioning? or like? The no, so, so first of all, the entire shape of the controller is completely different. They added analog triggers to oh, the mix. True. They changed the way the actual analog sticks are designed. Like they have more a physical shape where they're more um, uh, con they're, yeah, they're concave yeah. instead of convex, like the, the older DualShocks. They also added the touchpad, which was, you know, 
what however it was used it was an interesting idea basically like everything and the d-pad was also changed so there's all yeah. that and then yes of course there was the light bar which they tried to use um in a few cases and it would actually prove useful for psvr later on it's very true but uh i actually find it rather irritating <laughs> you see the light the, the light bar actually li lends evidence to the theory that the camera was always going to be in there yeah because right? they they put the light bar ah. they put the light bar now on. we have the legend <laughs> david uh, perry always not obviously to, to rag on him but the, there's that one photo i forget who of it was like the of all the developers standing on stage with their hands in front of their like their pants like if you remember seeing that photo i'll have to send it to you after the fact john reminds me very much <laughs> so of that uh, i don't i don't know how to stand on stage so, so the background here is that uh, there was a big cloud rush there was on live which mm -hmm. was pretty disastrous there was gaikai which was better but still pretty poor and then everything collapsed on live collapsed gaikai was in big trouble and then sony stepped in and bought gaikai i think at some point they actually uh, snapped up the on live patents as well mm. so they were they placed i think it was like something like 380 million dollars they, they they paid for gaikai here so they want a return from their investment, which arguably they've never really had because yeah. PlayStation now, I mean, it's got whatever, a million subscribers, but I doubt they're streaming. I think they're downloading. But yeah. here, obviously, they're, they're looking to sort of maximize the return from it. And they're talking about um, immediacy, instant access to, to games. They're talking about stuff that never happened. For example, um, yeah, uh, being able to stream a game, play it, and then buy it if you like it. That never happened. No. Uh, and I, I kind of think, you know, possibly that's the actually... cloud experience would put you off <laughs> rather than... Rather than... Oh, yeah. That's a, I was going to I was gonna say that I, I kind of like that use case because I'm not, I'm not a fan of cloud no. gaming as I've made too many <laughs> times. But as, some, as a way to sample something... That's actually kind of a neat idea, so I can I can see that being useful, but it never really came to pass. Obviously, see there it is. Try it now. We, we you still can't try it now <laughs> uh, on PlayStation it. now. Seven years later. Yeah. And for for uh, younger viewers here, it should also be worth pointing out here that Dave Perry is a guy that started up. He worked at Shiny. Mm -hmm. He was uh, kind of behind games. You know, he was one of the main guys behind Earth from Jim, MDK, and all kinds of other fantastic games from back in the day uh so yeah he was a legend in the games industry and went on and did this gaikai stuff at this point so it was kind of a interesting is pivot. he still a playstation these days no left years ago no. oh, um okay. yeah i think it was one of these um uh, deals where they acquire the company and the principals have to stay in place for a couple of years mm -hmm. uh, to be fair yeah. they did um, they did deliver playstation now um they did, yes. I believe the servers were actually built by NVIDIA at the end. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, but uh, they did deliver PlayStation now. It is still the same system that that they you know, rolled out all those years ago. I think it's still 720p. They, they were planning to roll it up. Uh, they were planning to upgrade it to 1080p at some point. I don't think that's happened yet. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. everybody's got a cloud system at the moment, and um, some might say that Sony kind of squandered whatever lead they had um, yeah, right. because they didn't really do that much with it i mean they introduced playstation 4 games um uh, i think it was in like 2015 or 2016 previously to that it was a way of accessing playstation 3 titles only so there was an additional infrastructure spend i suspect at that point um, we're still seeing quite a lot of lag added onto it. I mean, I could go back and look at uh, the analysis we did, but I think it was about 70 to 80, yeah. 80 milliseconds. So, uh, what he's talking about now actually is interesting. I forgot about this. The, sh the share yeah. button, that was another new innovation on this controller, and it's something that kind of became a standard thing at this point. And, the, you know, streaming is huge today in the sense that streaming, by that I mean like Twitch yeah. streaming, where you basically play a game, people can watch what you're doing, uh, and that's exactly what the PlayStation 4 enabled from the gamepad directly, basically. You could share screenshots, videos, get into the whole sharing interface. It was a uniquely forward-looking feature, I think, at the Definitely time. Definitely was. Yeah. Um, what was the original sharing standards, though? Was it 720p30? I actually forget. Uh, I don't remember. It was, yeah. I think yeah. it still is. Uh, yeah. I might be wrong there. I might be right. 
So now we're we're looking at that whole thing where I think he's talking about where you could basically share your video feed and and your controller input or do multiplayer games or something. Right. Yeah. There were some cloud features that yeah. did actually actually happen. So yeah, I think at this point he's uh, saying there's two things he's talking about here. Uh, he's talking about a director having actual uh, control over elements of the game where they can shift stuff about to help people out. Oh, and he's I he's see. also talking about uh, literally taking uh, control of the character in the game. And uh, yeah, what, what is this about UStream? Didn't they it, did they actually ship with UStream support rather than Twitch? I can't remember here. But they obviously. I don't. E I don't even know what UStream is anymore. Is that a previous competitor to Twitch? I honestly don't remember. Well, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, Smartphones and tablets. Yeah. And we're gonna give. So yeah, Gaikai. That was his. That was his big bet. And um, there was a big sort of cloud gold. Oh no, rush. he's talking about second screen. No. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah. You know, I really want to use my Nokia, you know, hand phone to play to play my PS4 games. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the iconography there is a bit <laughs> yeah. suspect, to say the least. Yeah, but you know, we did actually get to see, and here we go. It's going to be uh, the live demo of yeah, the Mac. Light behind the PS feed. I mean, if you're going to be uh, sort of showing a live demo of advanced streaming technology to a handheld Knack is your go-to game <laughs> it's um, oh yeah it's there it is also this is so this is the you know we'd, we'd previously just oh. seen that fmv sequence the trailer this is running poorly and then and then this is this is the game it's running much worse than the actual game does yeah. too it's like sub 30 with yeah tearing. the tearing in the middle there the too. final game has v it has v sync and it's much faster than that that's interesting but it's early yeah. you know not not to criticize this was still you know that's cool that he's demonstrating this. Yeah, no, yeah, right? Yeah, he brings in Mark Cerny to, to give his thoughts on what's going on there. And there's a bit <laughs> at the end, which I found amusing, where he says, well... Yeah, this is interesting. There's screen I've... space reflections in NAC. I don't remember that. Dude, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, NAC went, NAC went insane with SSR. It was the kind of game where, like, when you'd run through, like, an air vent, they would make all surfaces have SSR. And, like, all the floors and, like, there was SSR everywhere in this mm. game. They went so hard on it. See, David Perry here is a bit upset that Mark didn't say that his demo was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Those so games cool. instantly playable on the PS Vita as well. So to make remote play between the PS4 and the PS4. Well, I don't know. We actually measured latency on remote play. It was like 100 milliseconds. Yeah. That's, so that's this, this concept much. of precision control from Vita. Yeah, from I mean, that. the Vita was never designed to do this. It was, it was kind See, of... See, that's... that's Fundamentally, the problem is the Vita itself isn't well designed to handle a video stream in this way. Of course, the PlayStation Network and the PS4 will provide access. I think the lag is also on the encoder side, on the on the PS4 chip as well. So, you know, it was kind of doomed from the start, really. But that said, a lot of people really kind of enjoyed remote play at the time. I mean, I couldn't get on with it. Uh, I mean, smart services. Yeah, well, this is them... <laughs> kind of at the end of the ps3 xbox 360 and i guess even we had netflix um you know well this was like the this, Wii? this is part of the reason why microsoft's reveal was so focused on tv 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 uh because uh, this is actually a thing we haven't really discussed yet at the, at the start of this generation there was actually a concern a real concern that consoles were yeah over, good point right like mobile gaming, uh, you know, TV, Netflix, all this stuff. Like that was kind of what was viewed as the future. And a lot of developers were a little bit uh, cautious about investing in big games on these new machines just because people weren't sure if they would actually hit it big. Obviously, they did in the end. Yeah. But I think there was, um, there, there was some concern over that. And I think that actually kind of informs the direction Xbox would mm -hmm. go at the beginning of this generation as well but they've since tried to course correct and Sony kind of got it right here by mostly focusing on games but obviously for this section Dave's got to get in some of the multimedia stuff just to let people know that yeah it's all in there you can do it you know that's the thing it's yeah. there well earlier Andrew House was saying that the PS3 was the number one uh -huh. device for using for Netflix, Netflix yeah. so it kind of everything makes everywhere <laughs> I mean you know 
Microsoft are going to get a lot of heat um, for the for the TV TV decision, but they would have been looking at the telemetry coming back from Xbox 360s, which is that you know it was mostly used for watching Netflix at a certain point. They just crucially misjudged what the users, particularly the yep. core users, actually wanted from a games machine, especially in that crucial launch period, which was games. Yeah, the right. TV stuff. I mean, you know. Sony have just got it right here. They they realised it was a it was a value added extra, but it shouldn't dominate exactly. the announcement. You know, it was a multimedia box. It could do multimedia things, but this wasn't the primary use case scenario for a new console. Yeah. Wait, here we go. We have some developers about to discuss things. Right. Yeah. I mean, I watch this. I've got no idea what they're talking about. Really. <laughs> well, I guess one thing we could talk about though is that these developers though they kind of represent the fact that playstation even obviously you could say whatever you want about these exclusive titles that came out they did invest in exclusives early on that did come out you know after the launch period uh with like xbox one uh the the launch titles were so so and then there's kind of like a drought uh period after that pact um these you know like you know, you had Ready at Dawn there. The, their game wasn't ready at all for, you know, the PlayStation 4 launch. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. Wow. But, you know. Well, you know, we did get to see some really good games in this uh, in this reveal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for the people watching, uh, things are about to get interesting. pretty interesting, I think, soon. Hey, there's Yoshida. You see, he came to play a much bigger role in the marketing of the PlayStation 4. Yeah, right. But here he is. That's literally all you're getting of uh, Shiro so Yoshida. I actually think something Sony really nailed with PlayStation 4 was they, they managed to put on such a friendly face. They had the right people in the right positions interacting with the fans in a way that I think was really meaningful. And uh, it really captured a lot of people. And I'm a little bit concerned that without those types of people in place for ps5 they may not have that same mm -hmm. kind of like audience focused uh face forward that they did with ps4 and i'm really curious to see what happens there yeah i mean um i guess it would be well what's the, the nearest they've got jim ryan yeah that's you yeah. know he isn't exactly synonymous with the playstation brand i guess it would be mark cerny at the moment who is you know I mean, Mar mark is great he's still there um jim just you know he seems like a businessman but they had, you know, people like Adam Boys and all that. And back then, Shu Yoshida was big uh, as a face forward. All this stuff, like the way that these people addressed the PlayStation audience, it really made Sony feel like they were more personable rather than just like a big hollow yeah. company, so to speak. And I really think that helped a lot with the PlayStation yeah. 4. And Actually orientated towards what people who play games are interested in rather than, you know, the very different look that you got from Microsoft in its first early days of the Xbox One. Well, this is the they thing, isn't it? confident and cocky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Genuine passion for games. I've met Yoshida a couple of times. He's just super... I mean, everything that you imagine that he is based on his online persona, he is in real life and more so. <laughs> that's, that's really great. That's I'm, great. I'm always happy to hear and that. So, you know, Sounds I, like a great guy. I met him when um, we were talking about PlayStation VR. And he was just really excited. I mean, a lot of people aren't excited to talk to me. They're kind of a bit <laughs> worried about how we're going to report it. But he was really into Digital Foundry. He was really into PlayStation VR. He really wanted to evangelize what they were doing with uh, with VR. And mm -hmm. you see that that pure, unadulterated enthusiasm for gaming uh, in the kind of, um, I guess, especially at E3 time, which followed up from this. You don't really see him that much here. But you do have Mark Cerny oh. putting on a really slick, compelling presentation, a good story, strong specs. Um, you know, at that point, the, the hardware superiority of the PS4 was kind of established. They, they doubled down on that effectively with this presentation and they delivered. Yeah, they delivered. It's interesting. You mentioned PSVR and it occurred to me, you know, at this point, Project Morpheus, I guess, as it would be known, like there wasn't any hint that there was a virtual reality solution coming to PlayStation 4. And this was, in fact, the early days of the Oculus stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I guess the DK1 was on the horizon mm -hmm. or already out. I don't know what exactly when that hit, but it must have been sometime 
after this or around this time. So VR was not where it is now. And to think that this console would later on have a very reasonable, compelling VR solution is pretty cool. Yeah, I guess that goes back to the point earlier about it scaling in towards the future. Uh, it has enough power to do VR, you know, at its within its own constraints, obviously, but it does play VR games, something that you can't say of the Xbox One. I mean, the only problem with PSVR is it comes down to the move yeah, controller. Right? Like, the actual headset is great. The hardware can handle it. It's fine. It's really just the move controllers. They don't cut it. I yeah. wonder if then uh, when PlayStation 5 is announced, uh, how long it's going to take till we see a PSVR 2, and if we will. See, if if they do PSVR 2, I think the key thing they need to get right, and I, I think they should invest in making it wireless yeah. and compatible directly, and then also, oh, hey, it's cool. Dylan Cuthbert. But... <laughs> But yeah, it needs to be a more seamless, easier to use kind of setup without the wires with uh, inside out tracking for the hand controllers like the newer Oculus yeah, stuff. something yeah. that I don't have. Like just yeah. make it, get get rid of all the stuff around it. That'd be a perfect product. Oh, sounds expensive though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael did. Oh, this is, is this, this is who I think it is. He always looks like a, like a Bond villain to me somehow. Like he's. He's got this. Look at that. He's so suave. <laughs> that's, it's like, that's actually a pretty good. Point. Yeah. So I do say, <laughs> uh, like, like something in the form of "world is not enough" or something. That's fantastic. <laughs> so we are actually going to see some games now, which I'm highly excited oh, about way. because we've literally had like yeah, this a, is the part I've been waiting a for. kind of bizarre developer showcase, which showed nothing at all, but had some nice animations. Mm -hmm. but so, so yeah i remember thinking at this point what's going on here you know but this is where we actually start to see the promise delivered so yeah interesting stuff ahead here the system software engineers to help shape playstation 4's unique features i don't know you know obviously we get to see Killzone first of all uh, deeper more connected experiences and a newer emotional i just state. think uh you know unrelated to playstation 4 specifically but because this is 2013 We've kind of lost the fashion show side of the discussion, like we had in the last conferences. <laughs> right, you've got you a good those, point there. those big billowy shirts and the yeah. different, you know, it was great. Jens, Jensen's just, safari we don't, we don't suit. Have this now. Twenty tens. Ken Kudragi suits, man. Ken Kudragi suits. Those were like the way. Oh man, it was amazing. Twenty tens is way too similar to our own time period to have that nice retro clothes going on. Sadly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. This is a wow. Okay. Good. See, for me, this this upcoming demo was the point where I was just like, oh, okay, this is serious. <laughs> future, mankind has colonized planets in search of resources. However, I do wonder what's going to happen with Killzone over time. Obviously, Shadowfall came out. You know, it has a good reception. I know you like it, John, for its more open mm, approach to gameplay. It has, the reception's been pretty yeah. poor, even though I think it's, it's a solid yeah. game. But a lot of people don't like it for some reason. I'm not sure I'm why. I'm curious if they're going to bring it back in some some way in the future maybe as a multiplayer only title or I single player I, I would like to see it back again um i love the setting in this game though where i think we talked about this alex but they're basically sort of going after the aesthetic of uh, cold war yeah, berlin right? with the two halves of the city that's exactly what they're doing here and the world that they present is just that's beautiful cool, man. Uh, and really interesting it's such a cool visually striking game here we go yeah. and this Unlike the knack thing, this is actually real time representative of what the game looks yeah. like. Open it's that only door. taken us forty eight like, minutes to get when here. When you see that for the first it's time, like, like that just that's yeah, insane. definitely there's so much going on here, like the volumetric light shafts. Volumetric lighting in on last gen consoles like PS3, Xbox 360 was like almost not in any games ever. Very rarely there. And here it's like all across the screen. You know, PBR materials, yeah. great, you know, Q map reflections everywhere on the buildings. Got the depth of field there know, on right? the, the near field stuff that looks great. And also just the sense of scale, the way they've developed sort of a 3D skybox that goes way out into the distance with all the animations happening in there. Uh, it's, it's I was so also impressive. a big fan after this demo was done. I think not even a couple months later, there was a presentation about how they made it and like the upgrades to the engine that they had, even like how much uh, RAM they were using uh, back then during this demo uh, and things like that. There's a lot. Wow. Yeah. This has a lot of yeah. SSR in it as well. Yeah, this, game. this is using that uh, kind of post Crisis 2 SSR where yeah, yeah. Uh, it has like variable amounts of gloss. 
looks pretty great. I think they were saying that it was using something like 3.5 gigabytes just to render <laughs> this. Yeah, which, right. You know, when you, when you think about it, it's just insane. <laughs> For that time period, I know, like, uh, GPUs, like, had two or four at the be- at the most, other than the Titan, you know? So th- this this was the time period where people were reviewing the Radeon 7850 one gigabyte versus two oh, yeah. gigabyte, and saying, "Ah, oh, you don't, you don't need the two gigabyte card." Oh, oh. This, this oh, game boy. comes along a few months SSR later. There. See, look at the SSR there. See, the thing about this this demo and why this is so effective is one, it's very technically impressive, but also their their art team is incredible. And when you look at this now, this still looks good to me. Like this is still very attractive in a way that isn't usually the case with early software. And this is a launch game. And the the actual game looks yeah, this good. Yeah, I know, right? And, and it looks better in some aspects. I'm pretty sure some of the textures are better. Yeah, yeah they 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 actually improved things. Yeah, you're right. You know, like this, and I think Rise too are both like launch games where if you put them out now, obviously gameplay would probably be different <laughs> for Rise now. Uh, they still look really, really good. Wow. Yeah, like this. What a smart way to start the generation. For, like, look at yeah. that. Like this explosion effects here. Like it's, they're very beautiful. These lit particles. The way they do all that. I'm a big. F- they sort of use. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the uh, when you wake up here, like uh, one all the depth of field around everything, and also like one thing yeah. the Killzone series always did since they switched to deferred lighting back when it wasn't very common at all. They always put a bunch of like point lights around things, and they're like the Hellgas soldier who picks oh, you yeah. up eventually here, or wants to kill you. Uh, he's got like this great point lights illuminating his face and his his clothing. It just looks so cool. Their art design oh, is really man. good. This, this this still looks fantastic. I, know, right? <laughs> I would love to see a 4K 60 version yeah, of this Yeah, I know, game. right? It wouldn't take too much, right? I don't think so. Like, just... Oh, look know, at that. Right? It still pains still, me that there was no pro support for this. I know. That should have been the oh, obvious I answer. Know. It really should have been. It, this could have been, uh, like, checkerboarded, uh, much in the same style as Horizon Zero Dawn. I, man, look at this. Like, I just feel like everything, the VFX, like the way it all looks in motion, like this still holds up to me. Like this could be released right now and it would still be a great looking One thing game that, that I today. remember they changed for the final release though is the position of the view model. Like here, this is more Killzone 2 style where it's a bit closer and centered. And I think the oh, end yeah. game has it a bit more off to the side and like extended looking. Uh, yeah, you see more this, of the weapon. I actually kind of like this I view do too. a little bit better. I'm not sure why they felt the need to change Maybe that. Maybe screen space, weird. it takes up too much, they thought, or something. I don't know. I, I also prefer it like yeah. this. Also that sound. Um, yeah, I guess it looks a little bit larger here. It fills more of the screen area in this so, view. So, like, cover system. I remember that's one of the unique yep, parts the of Killzone 2 was that it had a cover system. But in this one, uh, he moves in and out of it kind of, uh, I would say, smoothly. Killzone 2, it's like a, yeah. an adherence system where you, like, stick to it. Uh, like grenade. I think looking at this game again, I think what a lot of people didn't like is that they moved to to more uh, open mm-hmm. levels, and that they would just have areas where you never, you didn't really need to go there, but you could often find multiple ways around to get to your I like objective. That stuff. And it, it, it wasn't like a cinematic uh, Call of Duty game. Like this makes it look like a Call of Duty style campaign, but it's really not. And I think that's actually what makes it more interesting is these large levels and. It's a little bit more, um, you have more control over how you progress through it. But at the same time, because of the way it's designed, it can also be a little bit confusing. But not to me. <laughs> yeah, I know, to, I, to I know someone. Some people, I know some people had issues with that, but I didn't think it was especially difficult. It was just, it was a different kind of game. And for whatever reason, uh, I guess that change just didn't sit well there's with a, people. There's a lot of really cool things about the rendering in this game that I've always really liked. So volumetric rendering this generation saw some big changes like this uses i would call it like bespoke volumetric rendering where you have to place lights that have volumes attached to them Uh, but this game did it so well by like adjusting their resolution in real time so that you could attach them to many many lights nowadays we uh, do it like uh, where there's a voxel volume in front of the camera and every light can be volumetric as a result of that but this is one of the first games i remember seeing like every so many volumetric lights everywhere and they all look pretty darn good. Yeah, that SSR. That's there, right? I mean, I went, I went to Gorilla to uh, to actually get a tech deep dive because they were so proud of what they were doing. I actually went to it see be, yeah. the. Um, it was a preview day, so there was a preview where a lot of uh, press were there, and I was there taking capture. And then 
the following day everyone went home and I hung out with the tech team and got a deep dive presentation into it's how so they cool. you know how they did this yeah. and it was like there's so many things which you're like you know I hadn't really seen before behind the scenes it was like okay so this is our cube map system here are our light probes that's like cool. whoa <laughs> Yeah, that's right, because this was all, like, moving into, like, PBR materials and, like, all the light probe stuff, and a lot of the stuff that we see has become standard today. Yep. It was very new at this time, and they were, you know, there at the beginning doing it, and very forward-looking. You know, uh, what fascinates me is the timelines here, because uh, development hardware for the what are now the current generation of consoles went out really late, but this yeah, is right? February 2013, so Guerrilla must have had hardware of some description quite early on time. but we do know of course that um the decimo engine as it was known uh, as it was subsequently uh, uh known, known was actually yeah. uh had an open gl variant that ran on pc and that's i guess that's how they did oh, a lot yeah. of their work there that's crazy but, um yeah i mean look at that <laughs> yeah i mean they killzone 3 had shipped just like in 2011 i think um so this wasn't that f long after that really like this game was developed in a surprisingly yeah. short amount of time they did a lot of crazy stuff with the rendering that. in a, such a very short amount of time oh my gosh. yeah right this kills it kills on mercy yeah. was based off the uh, open geo renderer oh wow oh yeah the vita mm. game wow gentlemen that that was uh <laughs> that's quite a demo like that is the way you yeah. do it i still think like you show that this was this was the crowning glory wasn't uh -huh. it where they shared the video uh, yeah and on it went social up media look at that and they actually showcase the in the interface there at the end of the like that's smooth expert yeah. expertly done drive club oh and here we go so drive club is a really good looking game let's just get that out of the way this is such <laughs> a, dude, uh, like th it is a crime that this game didn't get ps4 pro update <sighs> either i understand that the situation was not great at that point but like, this game is still one of the best looking driving games yeah, of the it's, generation it's pretty rare too because like this game obviously a lot of driving games always use um I would say Q maps attached to the cars and things like that. And like, that looks fine, but this is one of the first ones that like use Q maps and attached SSR to it as well too. So you could get self reflections, yeah. which makes cars by the way, look really good. A lot of racing games still don't do that. Even like uh, Forza Horizon doesn't. And I always thought that was a shame. This game, this engine was nuts, which I think it's kind of like uh, Evolution's Carmac, if you will, was uh, Ollie Wright. Yeah, right. Really, really smart guy. Like that guy, incredible. But they they went nuts with the engine features in this specific game, like the size of the maps that they could create, and they had that huge complex volumetric cloud That's system a good point. Yeah. going on, and like so many details that went far beyond what you really would need in a racing game. But it just created something that's so immersive. And I still think this game has the best weather effects ever in any that's driving wonderful. game to date. Um, the uh... One of the things I also remember is one of the first times we saw TAA on console, uh, but not like from like Crytek or something like that. Um, and theirs was interesting because like when you would sit still, it would look kind of jaggy. But when you'd start moving uh, due to the way it would kind of like blur yeah. the screen a bit, that's when the game started to look actually more CGI-ish. Exactly. Yeah. Hardware. We're in the next generation. Twelve Club was in, uh, kind of curious though because um, it's showing at E3 2013 wasn't that great. Actually had quite a negative no. reception. It didn't look anything like as good as we would hope based on this particular showing. No. Yeah. Obviously though, the situation by the time of launch radically reversed and it is a phenomenal looking well, game. The sad thing that happened with this game is that obviously it was supposed to hit around launch, especially with that trial version. It got pushed back like That's a year brutal. and then when it shipped the online servers basically didn't work for the first three months mm. so the online element was completely broken so there was so many problems getting this game out the door but the core gameplay the racing combined with the visuals and the soundtrack like it was just such a superb mm -hmm. thing like they did such a good job it's really good to play it just is like as in a personal thing like for the music they actually contracted out the uh, sort of the electronic music group. Hybrid oh, really? Cool. To do to do the original soundtrack. So they wrote original music for this game, and then they had other famous artists actually do remixes of that stuff as well. And it's all in the game. And like the music in this game is so good. Like it's really good. I love it. I think it adds so much to the experience. Uh, and it's just 
Yeah. Man, like it's such an audiovisual powerhouse. Drive Club, is. you know, Ali Wright now at Nvidia, and Rushi um, uh, is now at uh, slightly, slightly mad, mad, right? Working on Project Cars right. Three. And they had both done Onrush after Evolution Studios yeah. kind of collapsed, and Onrush is also a very impressive game uh, that was sadly overlooked. But if you haven't seen the video I did on that, go check it out because it shows a lot of what those guys can do, and just like how capable their engines were and like why we're saying ollie wright and all the team working with them like those guys they were just doing. like remarkably they're, they're amazing engineers and the art team as well like there's so much going on here i think sony did did sort of let down evolution evolution studios if you look back uh, yeah, at so um, what happened with uh, forza horizon very similar concept an offshoot driving game that's kind of like uh possibly initially overshadowed by the Colossus, which in this case would be Gran Turismo. But, you know, get behind the game, invest in the team. The second game, the third game, you look at what the um, Playground have achieved with Forza Horizon there. It's now eclipsing the original franchise yeah, right? entry. It's, it's I've kinda, I've, amazing. I've, I've heard some rumors, though, that uh, um, I guess the Gran Turismo guys weren't too thrilled about this, like Yamauchi and everything. He wasn't exactly happy about Drive Club being in development and the quality of the visuals. Huh. Uh, and that also, you have to remember, Gran Turismo 6 came out in 2013 after PlayStation oh, 4 true. launched, but it launched on PS3. <laughs> uh, so, you know, compared to what these guys were doing with Drive Club, like GT6 looked ancient. Yes. So, so true. You know, I, it's, it's, a, it's a bit weird, but Drive Club still, it is not Gran Turismo. Like, it has sim like elements to it but it's much more of an arcade racer, which is one of the reasons I like yeah. it so much. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of racing games that I also would enjoy playing. I'm not oh, super into the sim aspect, uh, although I do like the sim aspect of the cockpit looking really good. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I love about Drive Club as well is the way the dynamic time of day and weather systems worked. Like, you could crank up, I, if I recall, you could crank up the speed of it, or more like you could choose when you would mm -hmm. start racing. So you could like start racing at dusk or like late afternoon. And it's the sun is out shining. And then you see everything, the sun sets, the clouds fill in the sky, night falls, and the night in Drive Club was really yeah, dark. Yeah, that's a really good point. So there was a lot of just lights from the cars. And then the storm kicks in. There's like huge flashes of lightning in the distance. And like just the way, the the dramatic experience of that was very there's, memorable. Uh, it's something I love about this There's some things game. we've never actually figured out over time because this game hasn't had many like um, presentations about how its tech worked. We never really found out about how it does its like global illumination or things I like know, that. I exactly. And I would really like to know like over time because obviously for the time it allowed them to do have like this fidelity while having the sun actually move in real time. Uh, I would yeah, like to know. Like I assume that they had, they were like interpolating between different bakes or something maybe it could be that yeah right like i, I don't see how else they could be doing yeah. it because but yeah you're right it does have they have some sort of gi system in here that's very effective and it allowed for dynamic time of day they also had this um kind of smart i mean it looks really funny when you stop and look at it but like the trees i think they were made of like arranged parallaxed textures that looked like a whole bunch of leaves together but if you stopped and look at them, they would like rotate with the camera, obviously. Uh, yeah, so that was an issue where if you look too closely, you'd see the flaws. But unlike, like, say, the Forza solution where they just have billboards, like here, this solution allowed them to give the impression of complex trees as you race. And with the motion blur and everything, it just gave it a lot of depth yeah, that looked awesome. It would awesome. also have less aliasing, which is great. Yeah. So this is funny. I remember this guy coming on stage oh. and he was talking about like, like, uh, demonstrations and like Whoa. horrible surveillance state. And I was like, is this Watch Dogs going to be on PS4? Is this, they're going to show Watch Dogs on PS4? It turns <laughs> out to be like infamous Second Son, which was like, what? Uh, Dude, th this is actually weird to watch now considering what's I know, on. right? <laughs> like his presentation, uh, this is really weird. The dramatic just... pauses like this one. <laughs> that, that just kind of make it for me but this is where the i think the guy said afterwards that the uh that the teleprompter was was running with a with an element of lag which meant he had to pause <laughs> oh. which is why there's you know he's the sort of yeah he it's almost like a look of of horror at what he's just said <laughs> you know, know. Right? this dystopian so, nightmare it's this is this this is going to be infamous second son and this is uh, another great example of a game that's excellent to showcase early on because 
once again, here they are with this with this new engine. They have gorgeous PBR materials. Uh, their GI is excellent, but it doesn't allow for time of day changes at this point. Mm -hmm. So everything's kind of static and it loads between the different bakes completely. But man, it's very effective. This is such a beautiful game. Yeah. And they also went really heavy on GPU particles. Yeah, that's... A, which were kind of a new thing. They, they, you know, it's kind of interesting. So there's like a timeline of GPU particles coming into existence, like Halo Reach, and then NVIDIA doing a very different thing with PhysX, where it's actually like world space. And then like a whole bunch of stuff where it's like, okay, we bounce stuff against the G-Buffer and it exists only in screen space, kind of like this game but everyone didn't know how to like author it well. And I remember the big push behind this game was getting like authoring tools for like the developers to actually make not only just like a bunch of sparks come off something, but like they could actually look like something other than sparks, like the outline of Des uh, Desmond or Desmond, I forget his name's character. You know, like they it could do a lot more than your usual particle Desmond. system. I think you think of Assassin's Creed. Like, no, though. see, you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the art behind this and the way they built the particles that matters. Cause you're right, you can do like a simple particle simulation and it can look like cool, but also just kind of generic and not yeah. visually beautiful where the actual art here, the, the particles they created are gorgeous. Yeah. Also, this was the first time they showed this as well, huh? I think though, obviously. Yeah. Well, you'll have to maybe look back, John, uh, and throw this in the video, but I swear when they released screenshots for this game, they were like really, really, really high res, higher than 1080p. Like the initial screenshots uh, for this. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think Richard can attest to this, but in the past, like screenshots were handed out in high res for magazine publishing. Oh, maybe usually. that's why. Yeah, I mean, that is the traditional excuse. But when you look at 72 DPI 1080p, that's like much bigger than a magazine size. That's true. There's that's no true. excuse for it, really. It's just because they want <laughs> they want they don't want jaggies to be seen. That's the bottom line. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, sometimes you just get the screenshot uh, downsampled. And uh, that was the traditional bull shot. Yeah, so, right. so is this real time then, John, or is it a mixture um, of? So, I mean, to me, this looks like a rendered trailer, but it actually looks like it's directly derived from the in-game graphics because this is what the game looks like yeah. fundamentally. So, Which leads me on to the other thing: the uh, character animations, facial animations, and stuff were great in this as well. Mm -hmm. See, actually, you look at this trailer; the the final game looks significantly better than that. Yeah, it does. Because the the time of day they selected and the angles and everything, it doesn't really showcase just how beautiful it actually is. <sighs> this was another example of a game that shipped with an uncapped <laughs> I knew you yeah, were going to say that. <laughs> I hated this trend. <laughs> Knack was like that. Killzone Shadowfall initially was like that, and so was this. This and Killzone added a lock or a cap option later, but... I hated this like trend of yeah, let's just ship with an uncapped frame rate that's like thirty-five <laughs> to forty FPS. It would drive me crazy, honestly. It was awful. Thanks, Nate. And I'm pretty sure he's just won oh, the yeah, backstage suite for the coolest game introduction of the night there. The cool the coolest game introduction? <laughs> I feel like every time he stops and pauses, he's like waiting for a photo op. It's like turns, smiles, and they, you know, click, click, and then it's like back to <laughs> back, back to serious words. I'm trying to think here now, how much of the engine in Second Son is present in uh, Spider Man? Like, in terms of like, because like it, it doesn't have a time, real time time of day, right? You were saying, John? It's a different developer, isn't it? Wait, wait, so, say, say which one again? Oh, wait a minute. I'm messing up the developers. I'm thinking of Insomniac for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Alex. Never mind. Alex. Supporting smaller indies with their highly innovative and sometimes left field But eye. yes, this game, it is uh, not a real time time of day system. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't mind that solution. What they've done is they basically vary the time of day based on the moment in the story, right? Mm -hmm. So they kind of set the atmosphere based on any point along in the narrative, which and all of the times of day that they picked are always like gorgeous. So there's never a time of day that doesn't look awesome. Yeah, there's no basically. ugly high noon or whatever, you know, where, yeah, which never looks like, good in games, by the way. So you rarely see it. It's like one thing that I think sometimes... Like in terms of when people talking about games being downgraded, uh, which I think is usually overblown in a lot of sense, uh, is people don't consider that the time of day of when lighting is occurring will dramatically change the way a scene looks. Yeah. And certain game engine techniques don't translate very well to things like high noon or overcast. Like Watch Dogs, for instance. When you do high noon and Watch Dogs, it looks like nowhere near as good as at dusk. Or yeah, night. right? That's like when it looks great. Oh. Um, or when it rains. 
Yeah, or when it rains, which yeah, was exactly <laughs> the big point at the beginning of this gen, because you know PBR materials, SSR being added into game engines, we can finally do those things uh, well enough, uh, and everyone wanted to show it off. Anyway, due to the success of Braid, we've managed to found a new small development studio, and we've been working. So uh, the witness. He's talking. To, he's going to be talking about the witness. Oh, that's yeah. right. Uh, which would take quite a bit to come out uh, then after after this. Um, yeah, it, it was not a quick production. Yeah, uh, that's fair. It's an interesting looking game, though. I, I definitely yeah, really like beautiful. The, the art style and the use of like planar reflections everywhere. Also, killer uh, HDR implementation. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Really Never good. Never played it in HDR. It's one of the things I wish we could do sometimes for our, our videos is record in HDR and also use it really well on YouTube. Like, I don't really know how you. I don't do know that how either. The color space and and like everything is different. Yeah. You'd have to, you'd really just have to use a lookup table in Premiere to make it work, and that still changes the the end result. Yeah, right. And it wouldn't look like what you actually see on your screen, let alone the SDR so presentation. That that actually reminds me of a funny thing, kind of unrelated to this, but back. Do you remember when uh, I think it was the Xbox One X was revealed, and I was at E3 that year capturing a bunch <laughs> of Xbox One X games. Yep. And they had stuff in HDR, well, like four point. to seven. Yeah. And some big sites were just posting the HDR footage without tone mapping. So you had this like weird gray looking footage that was all washed <laughs> out and ugly looking. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh man, it was an HDR. Uh, so I actually went back and recaptured, but um, a lot of sites didn't realize that. <laughs> That's so crazy. Uh, it's like HDR does complicate everything for us and I, I really yeah, when it was new uh it created issues for i people. really wish there was some better way to cover it in terms of like recording uh, well i think um, with series x they've got hardware luts uh, so i'm yeah, assuming right? ev everything will just be a um hdr presentation they add the lut at the end if you're going to sdr maybe they could just share the lut with us that would just save a lot of time wouldn't it <laughs> yeah i know right like <laughs> because then we could have like games actually be presented in HDR and have a good SDR presentation for other people. And also, I guess it would help our editing chain. There's so many good things that I wish we could do. But. We're kind of totally ignoring the witness here, which I think is um, Sony's attempt to kind of emphasize its indie credentials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and during the early days of PS4, they were really focusing on the indie community. And I think it was kind of a, a very smart thing because obviously based on what i said earlier how a lot of big developers hadn't yet fully committed to the next gen and things were also very cross-gen it would took it would take a while to get the big triple a stuff up on these machines right. and released so targeting indie developers a lot a lot of additional software to hit the platform early on and it really gave them a spotlight I yeah think and you just got more diversity as well more diversity in ideas and execution exactly it was really really smart I think, I think they probably learned the lesson a bit from um, that game studio or with that game company, sorry. With, with Journey, with Journey yeah. and stuff where smaller games that could also look really good. And, you know, they have that jiffable presentation, which we've talked about tons of times, where there's like one spot in the game that just looks so great and so cool. Five seconds of that in the form of a gif will sell so many copies. And, you know, something like Journeys like that, I guess Flower has a bit of potential like that too. Um, you know, this game... I don't know. It looked really great when it came out. I think everyone was really talking about Rhyme, if I recall, around the PS4 yeah, time. Yeah, Rhyme was pretty cool. Now, see, what you can't see from this trailer is this was uh, also a 60 FPS game. Mm -hmm. That's true. And uh, seeing this running at 60 with like these bright, beautiful visuals, especially with HDR, which didn't really exist at this point during the presentation, but uh, it really added a lot to it. And it just made a very vibrant, just beautiful kind of experience. It's an interesting game. I, I like I like The Witness. It is really weird and difficult at times, but in a very fascinating way. I'm just kind of horrified that Alex used the word GIF. <laughs> Alex, I, 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 tried, I tried to ignore that. It's, it's, it's like it's like you I'm know. Just following what you the say you're a Star Trek fan, but you're still saying tem temporal. Oh, okay, yeah, I know. I love the way I love the way <laughs> Alex so casually destroys us sometimes. <laughs> And it's like kind of laugh like, yeah, well, I'm just saying the thing that the creator said, so you're wrong. <laughs> I, yeah. I literally sent you uh, a, a video of Star, Star Trek Enterprise with Captain, Captain Archer talking about the temporal Cold War. <laughs> and you still don't pronounce it correctly. And you're like the biggest Star Trek uh, nerd I know. I know. Uh, How about Picard? Okay, here we go. 
He's back. About that. What other, what other event would show you a game like the visceral and action pack? So, does Dr. Richard Marks come out for this presentation? Do you guys remember? He doesn't. No. He's at Google now. He doesn't work at PlayStation anymore. But did he work for, for in 2013 though, or was he already gone? Yeah, sure. He was. Um, he was working on PlayStation VR at this point. Yeah, of course. Wow. He was always kind of like their ace in the hole for like hardware innovations. He did a lot of great work. I do feel so what, a lot of his work was overlooked though. Yeah. I, exactly. I think it was unfairly overlooked in many cases. He did some really great stuff for the systems and demonstrate what is possible when you combine PlayStation 4 with unbridled creativity. So first up, please welcome, from the award-winning Quantic Dream, David oh, Hall. This is, um, so this is interesting too, because they're gonna, was this the Sorcerer demo? Oh yeah, it's a Sorcerer, it's another tech demo, which at this point, I guess they had also done that one for PS3, mm -hmm. and then they had to do a tech demo for PS4. What is the feature you want the most on future hardware platforms? I think this one looks a lot better than one, and the one after the fact that like the PS3 Contact Dream Crying demo, I forget the name of it. Um, that one looked, uh, uh, it's, it's awkward. awkward looking now, uh, but this, I, I would still say the Sorcerer still looks pretty great. It does. Um, I guess it is a little bit shame and that it didn't turn into a product eventually because I thought it could Well, I would, I would say that what Quantic Dream would end up doing with Detroit looks a lot better than this. Yeah, oh it's yeah. A, it's a really good, like Detroit is really good it's looking. something we have to find the time to cover on the channel because it did release on PC and it is releasing yeah. to Steam if it maybe already has I've, it. I've heard it's weirdly demanding yeah. on the PC. Yeah, so it would be good. I'm, I'm pretty sure they converted the engine over to Vulcan for it as well too. Oh, nice. Which would be great to cover. And also I think it would be really good to look at, we're going to do this with um, Horizon Zero Dawn and also with uh, Death Stranding, but to see what it, a checkerboard presentation brings over or how it looks in comparison to a, a real oh, 4K yeah. and to see how much we're losing or gaining or like what the trade-offs there are, are there. So like, I think that's one we could do really well with. Um, but funny enough, Alex, um, in the Epic Games summer sale, I have just bought Beyond, uh, not Beyond, uh, Detroit uh, oh. for PC. Yeah, you get, oh, I got 10 pounds off. So, uh, I thought, why that not? Should be something to be, so, yeah, uh, to be a fun yeah. project. Yeah. I don't think it's the the most uh, impressive use of checkerboarding on PS4 Pro. It's so post heavy. Oh, that's true. You ended up covering yeah. that game, right, Richard? If I recall, the the no, final I did, detail. I did this. Oh no, wait, I'm thinking of the demo. Maybe I did the demo, the demo, and uh, John did the full game. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get a bit of extra clarity, and uh, mm -hmm. I think the HDR was pretty good, but. Um, it was, yeah. It's uh, it's not exactly a fantastic checkerboarding showcase. It's definitely going to be the Decima games, Death Stranding, and of course, a Horizon Zero Dawn that I can't wait to check out to see know. what native rendering looks like compared to the checkerboard solution. I mean, I John, oh, yeah. John, you were with yes. me in um, uh, Gorilla when we talked about that. Yeah, they yeah. were talking about um, some loss of clarity which, you know, obviously we can see it still looks amazing though. So I am going to be fascinated to see how native 4K well, rendering holds yeah, up. Yeah, when Gorilla specifically, when they were talking to us, they said that their focus was on creating a more filmic looking uh, image in the end, mm -hmm. where you lose some of that pixel perfect, super sharp edges of native 4K, but you still get kind of a, it looks more like a film rather than like a game. So it's like cleaner edges, but a bit softer. Yeah despite you know targeting higher pixel counts and their resolve and approach to checkerboarding is really different i think than a lot of others out there and i think it's one of the best so, so this is kind of cool this is uh this reminds me a lot of the human head demo from nvidia except with hair and an animated uh figure but <laughs> or, these or what you were gonna say john the old man demo from ps2 oh that's actually <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you're right. It does actually. Uh, this uh, obviously is really good looking. Uh, oh, it still looks good. Day. Yeah, I know, right? Um, big part of making eyes look good is having light sources that can actually light them correctly. And if your game just only has point lights, it can make eyes look weirdly, yeah. I don't know, like wet or weird. Uh, so a lot of games have now moved over to having like discs shaped area lights, which really helps eyes look a lot better. And I'm pretty sure there's area lights in Detroit. And I definitely know, like, it's one of the reasons why people love the way characters look in Final Fantasy VII remade or remastered or whatever remade. it's called. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
reimagined um because they always like every single time uh, uh the cutscene start they spawn like a light right in front of the character's face and yeah. it gives that makes their eyes look pretty great i mean that's one of the best secrets of a lot of like cutscene rendering is like all these lights that get placed into specific scenes which mm-hmm. is kind of like actually filming yeah you right? know what i mean it's the same concept you're just lighting the scene so it looks its best Oh, Which this is, is fa- this is fascinating though. They brought out the guy from Media Molecule. He's going to mm-hmm. be talking about their concept for dreams here, and dreams kind of just released, right? Like, yeah, more it, or less. It took a very, very long time for this to actually be released, but it's amazing uh, what people are doing with it. I want to say, uh, good work, Sony, there for sticking it through and you know keeping them funded uh, to produce this game as well as they did. Uh, it's not an easy concept to get across at a board meeting, I think. No. And the fact that they even uh, made the game is, it, I don't know how it came out. Um, I'm just really happy it did. But I feel like this is a game that absolutely needs to be released on PC. Yeah. Like to really keep this community thriving, this needs a PC version. It's yeah, because there's so many things. Because like the modding community would explode then because people already love things like Gary's Mod and, you know, Roblox and all these other games where it's all about user creation. And this is all this is about, you know. Um, and it's such a unique method for creating, like, basically your assets and building stuff. It's very different and it's really uh, innovative. Uh, yeah, I think they're also looking at introducing a PSVR version of this, if I do not, if I do recall. Oh, man. That which, sounds great. Which would be great. And I'd also love to see it then if it ever did make the jo- journey across uh, to see this on something like my Oculus or even better with that, you know, really good controllers. You could do so much with this game. Surely this will make its way over to PS5. He's already uh, confirmed it. That's Alex Evans, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, I believe yeah. he did. Oh, a, he already confirmed it? Okay. I think he did a, an interview with Eurogamer where he basically gave them a mini scoop, which is that, yes, they've got it up and running on uh, PlayStation 5. Good, good. That's, that's excellent. I take your point about FPS. the PC port. Um, mm-hmm. I actually think uh, I've heard rumors that it is actually going to be coming to PC. Uh, it kind of oh. has to, really, when you think about yeah. it. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm happy about that. <laughs> oh, that'd be an awesome thing this to This is actually kind of like one of my big worries about Sony at the moment, which is that um, it makes perfect logical sense for you to run your games also on PC. And the blowback that they've had from the audience uh, to, to kind of, you know, dissuade them in the strongest possible terms from doing PC ports shame. of these games. I just don't get it. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's totally weird. Uh, yeah. As long as the the game is not being downgraded to run on another platform, like the original version is not being downgraded to run on some other platform, uh, I think ports make a lot of sense. You know. Uh, well, if you think about it, um, if the future is sorry, John, cloud based, Richard, Sony is going to have to produce versions of their games which run in the cloud. They've partnered with Microsoft, which means that. They don't have the money to, to set up their own infrastructure on a global scale. Yeah, right. So, you know, they're going to have to produce versions of their games, which are kind of more hardware agnostic. So, you know, the, if the effort is required to make these games happen on PC in whatever shape or form, then why shouldn't they release PC versions? I agree. I don't get oh, it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I hate the, the kind of... Um, uh, the, the kind of toxic reaction to what is essentially progress yeah Yeah. right i think there's maybe the maybe the um worry that it's going to hold back the games that's on playstation 4 or 5 that doesn't make any sense i mean i think playstation 5 is now the closest sony's ever been to pc hardware uh at all (laughs) like even you know ps4 you know it was slight different than pc it was mainly pc but now it's actually good cpu just and even has top of the line, um, you know, storage and things like that. This is the time to actually embrace uh, multi-platform. But I hope they listen. Well, effectively, the storage and the low-level APIs that they've got are what separates it from yeah. PC. Uh, the storage could be problematic in getting a first-party exclusive running on a consumer PC, uh, but it wouldn't be a problem for a cloud solution, that's for sure. And you know, in the fullness of time. Uh, we definitely will see the PC platform catch up with and surpass uh, the storage solution on PlayStation 5. Yeah, I think right right, right now with the storage situation, it's more that you need to 
go high end on the storage mm-hmm. side, I think, to match it or get to the point where you can run it. And not everybody necessarily has that yet. So it's basically going to be a new requirement yeah. for PC games, I think. It's like, oh, well, you need to have an SSD of capable think- of this kind of speed might become something you see as a requirement. I think one of the first hints of that is um, they released specs, I think, f- to how to run uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. That they, yeah. There's specs for that. And I think the the top end spec actually says SSD NVMe, um, <laughs> yep. which is really cool. So this is a bit of an iconic right. moment from that uh, PlayStation 4 reveal. Yeah. I still don't really understand what's going on. I don't honest. understand. Uh, back then I was also a little like, what the hell is going on kind is of thing. Is that Norman Reedus on the left it there? It like it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of rendering, this is very interesting. Uh, earlier, Alex, was, Alex Evans was mentioning the tyranny of the polygon. At this point of time, the renderer changed so many times over the development of the course of this game, but I think this is actually like some sort of weird sp- splatted point cloud system or whatever. Um, so you can technically see through every model. They ha- and they ended up changing that for the final game to oh, be yeah, more right. traditional. Oh no, this is like the Wii music moment. Yeah. The Wii? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> One thing I couldn't touch in my looking at this game in the review video was the musical creation in this game, which is apparently really, really good. It has like really good synthesizers. Uh, obviously, that's something we can't really talk about in a video all about, re- you know, reviewing the visuals, but apparently it's really good. Did they copy Wii Play? Yeah. Wii Music. No. Wii Music. <laughs> oh, Wii Music. That is not a good product. <laughs> The creative console. Thank you. What was the name of that creation style game that Microsoft made a while back? Oh, wow. Oh, Project Spark or something? Yeah, whatever happened to that? It had Conquer in it at one point? Yeah. I, I think that went away. It had a beta, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it just disappeared. Yeah, it did. It's a bit like um, a number of other Microsoft games that kind of disappeared over time, like Fable Legends, which. Oh, yeah, it was pretty much know. done. Pretty much that's, you know, killed Rare. Uh, well, not really. They had, that, they had that really nice GI solution in Fable <laughs> Legends. I know, right? Which technically, actually, that's an LPV solution. And what do you call it also uses it? Dreams uses LPVs right. for area lights. I love so. light propagation volumes. Big fan, big <laughs> fan. Okay, uh, he's talking about third parties now. My eye goes to Falcom. This is true. Kadakawa, oh, t- Shoten, Genki. What kinds of good... Dimps. <laughs> yeah, 505 games. A lot of third party yeah no right see which you know it turned out to be also a big reason why people ended up liking the playstation 4 in the end if you're going to get your third party games and you're going to want to see them in 1080p full hd with the best oh, frame rate on console oh, that's what you i do. think i know what's coming up here yep we were talking about this earlier actually john so yeah i'm going to be interested to see it play out do you want it to stretch all right <laughs> so i'm not uh, talking <laughs> he has so much energy he was at uh, EGX last year, actually. I go, no, good, good evening, everyone. So, and good morning, those in, in Japan. I have really been looking forward to... What a charming know. guy. I yeah, know, right? He's great on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So he's going to be revealing the Capcom engine that never was. Yeah. Now, this, there's... I still am a little sad that nothing ever came of it because if you read, like they even put out presentations from the time period, it was running on things like a GTX 570 is what they originally did, like a lot of their internal research work on. So it was doable to a certain extent. I, I really do wonder what like what made this not pan out in the game. Was it the game or was it the engine's mm. too high feature set? Was it not good for creating game worlds i don't know i've gathered that they just didn't at the time they didn't really have the staff uh necessary to pull all of this off in the end they could they just couldn't get it done oh, no. and they sort of refocused their efforts on the re engine instead which yeah. was more suited towards the types of games that they were trying to make but what's interesting i don't know if you guys remember but deep down actually showed at showed up at tgs one year and it was playable and it was showing yeah. six, 60 fps as well wasn't it 720p 60 or something like yeah that? it was 720p 60 i think and, and it, it, which you know obviously at the time people were like what 720p oh, who cares 60 <laughs> that's cool 
um you know like there's a lot of really cool things that were shown off i remember that tgs they had like monsters that had like fur on them that would move and stuff like that they had like a lot of really cool there's a lot to talk about in the tech behind uh this demo which we ended up not seeing a lot of this technology in real time in games during this generation i think it will definitely be something we'll see in the ps5 xbox series x generation though by far. I mean, we've already seen Unreal Engine 5, which has some technology that's similar to what we see here. The PSP allowed us for the first time to take our PlayStation experience out of the living room and into the world using communication. I like how they're kind of going through their technical history here. Yeah, Monster Hunter was a big thing for Capcom. Capcom was actually a massive supporter of the PSP. There's so many Capcom games in there, just like Dreamcast. You know, I wish Monster Hunter was on a better engine sometimes rather than what it currently is on. Well, uh, I mean, uh, the the most recent Monster Hunter was the only one that was on the full MT framework. Yeah. Right? All the older ones were portable games, mostly, but, except but, for the original PS2 releases. Oh, oh there's oh my gosh, I forgot about the... Wasn't that the Chinese release of a Monster Hunter game that's running on CryEngine, of all things? Oh, geez, I don't know. <laughs> I forget what it is, um, but that's a thing, too. Here we go. Pantare. Codename Pantare. <laughs> Physically based rendering fluid simulation. Yeah, I like there's... asset based development. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that means exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so like the the fluid part of the fluid si- oh, simulation. It's like is Crisis really cool. Man. I know, right? Like look at yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite things about the CryEngine 2 reveals all those heads yeah. stacked in a row. These heads, the heads. <laughs> Um, yeah, but like fluid sims for particle effects. The only time we really saw that at all, really, uh, was like Arkham Knight on PC, maybe. Yeah, uh, and well, <laughs> you know, the, you know, like that's about it, and that's expensive as heck. Gosh, so. man, Arkham Knight. That's now that's a game you t- you look at. You look at when that came out and how it looks. Like, what a yeah. stunning achievement that was. That's really good. Not, game. PC version aside, which had issues. <laughs> Like as a console release, that was that really lived up to expectations as to what those machines could do. Oh, look at this! Oh look man, up. this is so. Gosh, there's a lot going on here. That fluid effects, uh, particle yeah. sim, that can like obviously rebound off of materials and rebound off of walls. But then there's like all the lighting in this. All the specular lighting is done through like what is essentially voxel tracing. So you can get like GI and indirect reflections off of like metal and things like that from this voxel trace. It looks way better than most current gen games uh, in that aspect. Yeah, um, but it, it actually looks rather feasible when I see it now again. But it's just we there's some there's certain things that just weren't really done this generation. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah. I think I remember people being very dismayed after the fact that they attached a HUD into a number of these uh, uh, snippets here because they thought it looked like fake but in the end that could actually be what the game's hud looked like yeah, yeah like this that's fluid good stuff that's that's insane and i hope I we see this stuff next gen i know right it looks really good in that aspect also like the oh yeah this is a beautiful this is motion insane. blur great yeah. depth of field it's a little low res the depth of field actually if you watch it yeah. in, in full resolution trailer but it's you know back then bokeh depth of field wasn't exactly and that's the thing though you see this and knowing what capcom had done with the mt framework it seems not that infeasible that they could get something close enough to this right? in many ways. Uh, but obviously, you know, it was not to not to happen. So we actually saw this running in real time on a PS4. Yeah, yeah, this was shown this game. Uh, I think it was TGS 2014, maybe. Look at that. Wow. Or maybe later that year. I can't remember when it was shown. But yeah, it, it, there's videos out there, I think, even. I remember um, this ending. It's very funny. Um. <laughs> there was a whole yeah, push was, for the whole social thing wasn't there like i'm stuck in a game yeah, help social. help me Se- second yeah what is, what is <laughs> that why was this weird focus on like come help me in my game right now it's like who is like playing <laughs> the system or like available at any point just for that where just throw can you imagine getting a message in your phone like i'm playing this game right now i need help like, i need health you're potions like, you're like uh what <laughs> Uh, I guess the design for this game, though, was when you see the videos from that TGS, uh, it's like cooperative dungeon crawling. 
Is that what it kind of like? dungeon crawler, very obviously inspired by the popularity of Dark Souls. Yeah. And the interface, like the gameplay, like it's that type of game. And, you know, it could have been cool, but. The, the one thing that excited me, though, was like, I guess I kind of like that midi, dark medieval fantasy look that the game had. But, you know, Dark Souls has always had it as well, too. But their technology has always been behind the times. And it was kind of cool to see that art being brought to life with a, an engine that which could do it better justice. Oh. Uh. So here comes Square Enix. They're going to showcase Agni's philosophy, I mm. bet. Yeah. Did they actually show it running on the PS4, though? I think they do actually say it's running in real time. Yeah, I think so. <sighs> Did, that would be something interesting to do lineups with Agni's philosophy running on the PC and PS4. I actually honestly cannot remember the big differences between the demos off the top of my head. So this would have been their um, uh, Luminous engine, That's I right. guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Luminous Studio, which was only ever used for Final Fantasy XV, which is a gorgeous game. Yeah, it's so good looking. And uh, it scales obviously really, really high. There's like the Agnes yeah. Philosophy demo. There's also that one NVIDIA demo they did. That's uh, right. I forget the name of it um, off the top of my head. But that those all like shows that it scales to even like beyond next gen, like offline rendering almost looking in some aspects. Uh, and they did it recently too, um, Square Enix with... They had a path traced demo recently uh, showing of off a, wo- a woman putting on makeup in the mirror, which is insane. <laughs> uh, path tracing models like that. That's awesome. Yep, Luminous Studio. State of the art game engine. I believe. Yeah, it- in many ways, I think what they did with Final Fantasy 15 looks better than what they did with Final Fantasy 7 Remake. Yeah, I agree. Uh, even though it has some roughness around the edges due to its difficult development history but when it's when it's running on all cylinders it looks insane yeah it's it looks really really good um i also think i really wish it didn't launch with those like weird frame pacing issues on I the know. console i mean that's kind of it was kind of okay on the pro as oh, long as you ran and i think xbox one x support also fixed it but now compare know. these uh slums to the final fantasy 7 slums <laughs> uh, well see this is what final fantasy 15 did really well is when you had these like city environments and other like complex scenes like they had like a depth and quality to them that was unusually impressive i think yeah right like, this, the towns in uh 15 look great i always loved the particles here they look really cool like do you remember that did i don't know if you played far enough into the game but like chapter eight or nine when you get to that like uh that city on the water that massive city uh it's so detailed and incredible looking it's still one of the best looking things i've seen this gen i've only um seen it by looking actually at your save that you sent me John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which yeah it's, it looks really really good it's so beautiful yeah. yeah and this here you know obviously this is in terms of uh i guess i would say uh, this is these are still really good looking cinematics by the way um they're, yeah yeah they're like really wide right up there i don't know how much we attained this this gen for many games obviously a lot of games uh, did have really good looking cinematics in the end, uh, but this is still really damn good looking. I think it's one of the signatures of this generation that the real time cinematics have kind of now finally eclipsed FMV. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean that's that was one of the big things where like you know Naughty Dog games on PS3 all use uh, pre rendered video for all the cutscenes. Right. Where this generation they've moved entirely to real time. So. And, and I think that's the hopefully the big push for next gen is having more equalized look between cutscenes and gameplay graphics. Uh, ray tracing will help that a lot. Uh, oh yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that are going to help that a lot. Even you know like what UI, UE five put out. It's not ray tracing, but it's very similar to it. It's tracing, you know, voxels and sign distance fields. That will really help to make gameplay graphics not look so different uh, than cinematics. Because lighting That's is so key. Yeah. Lighting is key. Oh, wow, boy. look at those particles on her hand. Yeah. Like, that was that's on the blood. Whoa. Yeah. The that, bullet coming out. Yeah. That that's impressive. There's some great looking stuff in this demo. I know. I always liked the volumetric lighting, which is funny because I actually don't remember any sequence of Final Fantasy 15 that has volumetric lighting. Oh, man. you're. Hmm. <laughs> is there any that point. you can remember? It's obvious the engine supports it as it shows off here, but... Huh. I don't remember. I feel like it's in there, but I can't recall. I actually can't recall as well either. See, look at this. I mean, if you look across the generation, a hair rendering has always been kind of... We haven't quite cracked yeah. it yet, have we? There's been some uh, 
promising well, it's, R and D. At least has improved a lot since the prior gen, where every you know they made everybody bald. Just <laughs> yeah, or have helmet heads. Have you know, that. like everyone has a helmet or hair that looks like a helmet. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or a crew cut. <laughs> Square, <laughs> Square has done really well with hair, though. Like, FF fifteen and then Final Fantasy seven remake. They have really nice hair design. I kind of want to say Japanese developers in general have done better hair across the generations than most Western developers. I kind of think Resident yeah, Evil Six's hair also looked pretty okay back good. in the day. Wow, that looks, that looks like Lair. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, they have the candles around the side oh, there. Look at that yeah. on the screens. You know, this one thing that I dislike about demos, though, graphical demos, is when they don't release them after the fact to run on your home machine or I run on know. your console. Like with PS3, you could download like the Killzone 2 demo, like that oh, one video. Oh, yeah, Behind the Bullet. Behind the Bullet, you know, like do that. That stuff's fun. It's cool. Oh, it excites that. people. Um, and also, like on the PC side, it's super exciting to see how poorly or great a demo runs on your computer. <laughs> I mean, I, I loved it when uh, Unreal released the Kite demo. And eventually the elemental demo as well too so well hopefully we're going to get that uh, playstation 5 tech demo yeah right yeah we'll see how long that takes to come out i think they are revealing publicly unreal engine 5 for download early next year so yeah i think a lot of people are going to oh, be yeah. compiling that demo assuming it is i think tim sweeney has said it will be released he has said they'll be, be able to benchmark good. it should be interesting to see how expensive the indirect lighting solution they have is because obviously it's using something that's a little bit more similar to like SVOGI, like Svogi that Crytek uses, or I guess a little bit like what you saw in the Tomorrow Children, uh, but you know, modified with screen space stuff. I'm curious how expensive that is because uh, it's probably not cheap. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Oh man, Hashimoto, he was like the king troll before they announced Final Fantasy VII Remake. Yeah, right. When he went up and announced Final Fantasy VII for PS4 and it was just a port <laughs> of the PC version. <laughs> that that moment was so good. Yeah, right? <laughs> so why do you think Square moved to Unreal Engine 4? And do you think it was worth it? Uh, I gather that they had a lot of development issues with Luminous. Um and they would just wanted to move to another engine that they didn't have to do upkeep on, maybe. Yeah, there's... Uh, it's a shame, though, because it seems like Luminous Studio was really capable and um, could have been used to do a lot more. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking of another thing is that if you want to build a team of people who want to make a new game and you need to reinforce that team, people know uh, nowadays they train themselves on Unreal Engine 4 and its workflows. So if you use exactly. that engine, people that are hired on, they don't need a lot of time learning your tool set necessarily. That's a really big advantage. Um, but I do find it a shame. I do like engine diversity at times to see what other developers can maybe make what you know that you won't find in another engine. Wait, who is it? And a personal friend. Over the years, Ubisoft has become an extension of the PlayStation family, and their support for our platforms has produced hit after hit. The Ubisoft oh, team is true. Oh, I know what it's going to be. Next generation yeah. gameplay, and I'm very excited by what they have to share with you tonight. Please welcome Ubisoft co-founder and CEO, Eve Guillemot. I mean, this is one of... I don't know. It's not. It's not the iconic moment for this game. No, no. But there were still questions being asked. At E3 last year, I asked you all a question. Who really controls our cities? <laughs> yeah, this is like the exact same presentation as the infamous Second Son beginning. Who controls our yeah. cities? Oh, I don't know. Our next-gen titles, Watch Dogs, we have the... Remember when Watch Dogs was supposed to be a launch game? <clears throat> Crazy, right? I think... I actually still think Watch Dogs in its final form looks really good. No, it does. It got a, it got a lot of unfair flack because of that initial demo. But even then, I don't think it's like that far off no. in a lot of ways. Like, I think it's that thing we were talking about before where the, the lighting conditions and the different times of day can give you the wrong impression. Mm -hmm. I, that's what I really... It, it looks great when it's raining. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, give it, give it that night. nighttime rain or like... Uh, dusk. Dusk, you know, sun's going down, long shadows... Uh, I remember people even getting upset with the game because it used cube maps. They would walk up to like 
of the, like a store uh, side like um, window and be upset that the world is static there. No game oh. does that well. Like no. people complaining that Watch Dogs doesn't do it uh, is BS, and you know. Just you know, a lot of people picking and so, choosing. Uh, there are do- there th- are downgrades though. I think in some yeah, aspects, yeah, for sure. but like uh, in terms of maybe like shadow resolution, if you're looking model at model complexity as well. Model complexity. Like that theater that they enter, the light bulbs are all modeled in the original demo, but it's like just a flat texture in the final. Right. You know. So there are things like that, but like the core lighting technology is very much the exact same. That yeah. just comes down to it. Like I think being a small vertical slice a demo versus like a full open world game. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like. That level of detail and and perfect per, uh, presentation is difficult to maintain across the large open game like that. So, what is the name of this engine? Is it Anvil Next? Is it the same? No, kind? this is not Anvil Next. This is yeah. something else, I think. I forget the name of the Watch Dogs engine yeah. necessarily, but uh, this should be interesting to see how it scales to next gen because with Watch Dogs Legion, Watch Dogs Legion coming out, wow. um, they're you know. I forgot support. that Watch Dogs Legion is a thing. We, is that coming out yeah. on next gen? We played it, John. Remember that? I remember <laughs> playing it in RTX with reflections everywhere, yeah. solving the problem you were just talking about. Yeah, so like this is uh, this was on the Disrupt engine. Disrupt. Okay. Disrupt <laughs> engine. I don't remember that name, but so it is. Um, I would love to see how this scales to next gen. What it's gonna, what's gonna happen there? That's oh, this like this cross gen period when we see you know, next gen titles on PC with like ray tracing. I'm curious to see like what they're going to do with the next gen consoles, whether they're going to enable ray tracing, whether they're not going to bunt, you know, like boost the resolution instead. I'm really curious how they're going to end up balancing it. In this case, I would think it would be cool to just keep like, uh, add ray tracing and keep the resolution frame rate stuff similar to the current gen consoles. I would like that a lot too. Cause they target 30 FPS anyway. Um, yeah. you know, People, I don't think, should really expect certain developers to produce 60 FPS titles because they haven't historically in the past, yeah. uh, even when the power's there. Um, so I think Ubisoft's going to be one of those key players that keeps a lot of titles at 30 uh, and pushes resolution and effects and things like that. An open world. Yeah, I know, right? It's great. There's a lot of tearing in this demo. Yeah, I think the, this, this is the first time we see it the, and the final game actually runs very well, mm-hmm. but these early demos that they were showing don't run great. Oh, but the game does have amazing water. I oh yeah, right. That, that the, is really water good. in Watch Dogs is awesome. They actually use like geometric sort of waves. I think are like kind of ripples. Yeah, right. Then they kind of like. Um, for, I, I love the way it looks too. The it's very similar in Watch Dogs too, and I actually think they imported the very similar technology into like uh, I want to say like. Was it the new Assassin's Creed games as well? Too, yeah, starting it? with Origins. Origins. That's Assassin's one. Creed Origins and up have that really nice water as well. Yeah, yeah so look at that tearing. The shipping game doesn't look yeah. like this. What's that? The shipping game doesn't look like this. Does it not? <laughs> uh, not to this degree. Um, I mean, uh, the, the kind of established internet wisdom is that the initial demos of Watch Dogs were running on some super high end. PC. GTX 60 GTX 680 machine something like this, that this to me though this this looks more like what the actual game looked like versus that original demo I, I one thing I would say is like I guess the way we could look at that is like one resolution this is 900p right on ps4 yeah yeah I guess like that's the one thing that uh, would like if this is actually t- 1080p or not how, I do, how can we tell though this I know he has speed is like 720 but like I'd say like in terms of like daybreak or like like this time of day right here this looks a lot similar to the game it just doesn't look as good as the initial demo no like, exactly like, this was the first time we saw like, the game i think after that demo that's how i would look put as, it yeah good. there's even like so like for example people would probably complain about how this area looks right here but he's in indirect lighting and yeah. in, in modern game engines you have ssao and maybe a slight ambient color usually there's not much you can do for dynamic objects without tracing so watchdogs is unfortunately a great looking game, I would say, that is like let down by the reality of hardware of the time period, both on PC yeah. and, you know, obviously a GTX 680 could run this well, but also you're playing at 30 FPS then with really high settings. But I um, do appreciate that when you, this did show up on consoles, the, um, uh, the PS4 version at least ran very smoothly, very consistent 30 FPS. Yeah, right. And it had motion blur. Yeah, right. Which Ubisoft really hadn't done before. Which really so there's a story. There's a story about the original uh, E3 2012 asset 
Yeah. So at some point I'm going to share, um, but it wasn't running on PC. That's all I can say at this moment. Wait, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> and uh, the, I mean, the reason I'm not going to share the details is that the the story I've heard is so unbelievable about how they managed to get it running. Oh, wow. You'll, you'll uh, have to tell us needs, offline. It need, it, I, need, I, I will tell you this. offline. It needs double sourcing, though, put it that way. But um, <laughs> oh. the source that I've got is is pretty impeccable. But, um, yeah, it, it would never have looked like that. That's crazy. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, well, sorry, folks. I guess we can't share that one yet. <laughs> at, at some point, hopefully, I'll be able to tell the story there. Is and that... <laughs> hopefully get this, this story verified because... Um, it is remarkable. So one thing that is actually downgraded here is there's parallax occlusion maps on the stones uh, right I, there. I know. I just I was just gonna say. That. And I know the shipping game doesn't have that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So you're there right. is a downgrade there. That looks still pretty cool to me, um, except for the. We tearing. saw a lot of parallax occlusion maps this gen, though. Yeah, no, I'm it's happy really more nice devs games. use it because if you have just a normal map on a flat surface, what are you doing? I don't know. But, I mean, uh, so if this demo if this demo had no tearing and uh it ran at a consistent frame rate i mean look at it it would still hold up today it was it, people would still be pumped for it like yeah you're right the tearing really uh hurts full screen tearing too not just at the top which makes you wonder was like i mean are they using an adaptive sync then like because that's pretty brutal it's right in the middle of it the looks, screen <laughs> it looks kind of just v zinc off to me yeah, but yeah. It looks, it's what i like to call ps3 tearing <laughs> Right in the middle. Wow. Oh. I mean, uh, in terms of, so next gen's coming. We're looking at this. This is a pretty systemic world in general. I don't yeah. really say the Watchdog games are very good at that. A lot of physicalization and a lot of yep. systems. What kind of new stuff will next gen CPUs bring us is an interesting question. We we don't have any good examples other than something like Star Citizen out there. So I'm really curious what studios that do ambitious CPU titles like Ubisoft are going to end up doing because their games thrash CPUs, you know. Um, that's true. But one thing that's really that we didn't know at this point in time, but we know now is that people still complain about frame rates. But this generation, like the the degree to which the average frame rate improved in games mm -hmm. cannot be understated. Like if you go back to PS3 and 360, especially open world games, but even not like, yeah. Hitting 30 FPS is actually not that common. Most of those games I'm really gonna struggled agree. to get there. Yeah. And there was often severe tearing to go along with it. Like The fact that we have a lot of these big open world games running at mostly a consistent 30 FPS is like such a big improvement over where PS3 and 360 were. Way better. Way better. Well, Obviously, though, the focus in the PS2 era, yeah. era was more 60 FPS. Yeah, exactly. It was so, a, PS3 360 was a massive downgrade in terms of average performance per game. I think they should have almost kept 540p or something like that, or 480p, and just gone for higher, you know, quality per pixel or better frame rates in a lot of games. Because 720p obviously looks fine on the sets of the day. It's okay, but not everyone had an HD screen when it started, anyway. Well, if you look at the design of the 360, the ED RAM, yeah, right? 10 megabytes of ED RAM wasn't enough for 720p. It right? does kind of suggest that a lower resolution was in mind at the design phase. I would like that. 540p games like Alan Wake, that look really good. Oh, if it were that easy. You know, uh, you know one of the things that uh, people don't really know about Blizzard is... So, was this the first time they were announcing that... Diablo. Diablo. Yeah, you can't even say it right, John. I know it. See, I, you I, say I say the joke so much. I always say Diablo. It's a joke now that I, when I first think about it, that's what I want to say. Oh, uh, yeah. Diablo. Yeah. I think. I've ruined it for myself. I know, right? I think, this is... <laughs> um, I think this is actually the first time talking about it. This is a big change for the series because, um, well, Blizzard changes over time, or obviously something from a PC gaming perspective is very interesting to talk about, but them focusing on a wider market. Obviously, it has certain ramifications for their games uh, from a PC gaming perspective, but obviously Diablo 3 plays really well on a controller, which is surprising. Uh, uh, that, I would say it plays better than it did on PC. Yeah, um, so like, there's there's a lot to say about that. Uh, I guess maybe it says, but Blizzard's different than it was back then and uh, different oh, now, yeah. now, so... They obviously found a lot of success on console with games like Overwatch. Yeah, right. Really? Yeah. 
<sighs> Not my style Wait. of games, but What's the announcement? So it goes. The game that Blizzard Entertainment will be bringing to the PlayStation 4. Did you pronounce it Diablo? <laughs> well, Who, me or John? Get, this, is, this is bothering me now. Diablo? Well, <laughs> I, it's, it's Diablo, but Correct. I've always had a joke where I call it Diablo. <laughs> Which is great. Kind of channeling that like yeah. uh, down-home uh, Midwestern accent. <laughs> You know, do they even show gameplay here? That's it, literally. That's wow, it. That Look at this it. logo, <laughs> clapping. You know, it's clapping and Sue. That was really funny, yeah. actually. Which is, which is, so bad. Uh, and you, like, if you compare it to the way they've uh, demonstrated their games before, usually in the past, they have really great opening trailers. Obviously, yeah. for the most part, pre-rendered. But um, that's always been. I'm a, just at big, this point, though. I'm just crossing my fingers that they don't wheel the EA guy out to talk about a sports game. <laughs> they love to do that at these conferences. Like, uh oh, here it comes. Here's the <laughs> next sports iteration segment. of Madden that looks the exact same as the last iteration. Or of they Madden. they they bring out the EA guy and then some athlete of the year. <sighs> I'm, uh, and then they come out like, yeah, I love Madden. John and I Ooh. got a lot of flack under our Xbox Series <laughs> X reveal for not knowing oh. the name of a North American football player. I'm so sorry. I just don't watch the sports. Didn't mean to do yeah, respect. Like, no, disrespect like zero him. offense to them, obviously. Yeah. Like, it's just, I just have no idea who that guy I is. I used to watch American football, yeah. but uh, I, you really can't over here in Europe. Not easily. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially the times when it airs and everything. Like, it just, it's not, it doesn't work. So I kind of fell out of it and I'm not really paying attention anymore. I remember. You sound devastated. Yeah. <laughs> Are they even doing football games now? Probably not. Madden's still a thing. Yeah, of oh, course. Oh gosh, this, is we haven't covered it in so long. I mean, I don't even know what that what engine. The only one of us that I mean, Tom always covered FIFA. Yeah, it was right? kind of his bread and butter. That, that's an interesting thing. Maybe there'll there will be some innovation in sports games for next gen. I just think, uh, from what I hear from people who are very interested in sports sports games, is that they're a little bit sad sometimes that when sports genres are limited to one single company like EA with Madden. Well. The more the, so, as I see it, I feel like the developers of Madden probably have one of the most difficult jobs in the industry. Yeah, right. Because they've continued to need to release a game every single year, but that doesn't mean. But game development's getting more and more complex, and like production times are increasing. But they still have to do this yearly release, and that just seems like a death march to me. Yeah, I wouldn't. Like it's amazing be on that, that game. they're able to do this. One more partner. Oh. Oh, I know what it's going to be. This publisher is known for making not just some of the biggest video games okay. on the planet. It's, it's, oh, yeah. It's going to be Bungie. Medium on the planet. They are one of the driving forces <laughs> behind turning video games Destiny, into mainstream man. popular yeah, culture. Yeah, it's about Destiny. And My pleasure to welcome to the stage the CEO that, of... Speaking of game development engines that had a lot of trouble at the start of this generation, Fanta Ray, I guess would say Luminous Tools, or, and this too, their engine, I, I remember reading after the fact that the reason why they had so much trouble getting out all their content was because the engine just couldn't produce it easily. They were having so much trouble with their tool set to even get stuff on screen. Uh, so imagine Bungie having a competent engine behind their game. That'd be amazing. One of the most iconic hits on each and every one of them. And I think uh, Destiny 2 pretty much sorted that. Yeah, it, it's, it's way better. They obviously put out a lot more content really quickly, um, for sure. I still think rendering wise though, I want to see it be better. I, I don't know, it's 30 FPS I, and I think that's for CPU reasons, but I think even like in terms of rendering, I've always felt like it could be better looking. It still looks in some ways in my eyes, like a little bit last gen -y in some ways. I don't know what it is what, about Destiny? Destiny's render. Yeah, I don't know what it is about Destiny's render. Well, I mean, Destiny 1 was on last gen. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. It's the last gen <laughs> package. There was, there was a 360 and a PS3 version. Yeah. Maybe that's it. So it's interesting, though, like to consider Destiny was when Bungie moved away from Halo and Xbox. And so it's kind of fun to have them up here yeah, on right? stage um, after that. This was the first time. Yeah. And it's funny now because they've now moved away from Activision as well, too. Yeah. Bungie does things their own way, it seems. And, you know... Just get out of their way or, you know. <laughs> Ten years, oh, yeah. yeah. I think Des Destiny 2 is coming to next gen. I think they might have announced that. 
Oh wow! Um, See, that's another next gen. In, in which case, there's just no excuse not to have 60 frames per second. Yeah, yeah it'd be exactly. Really bad. I mean, I remember that was the huge push away from people who would like raid and stuff or do competitive play uh, on console. They all moved to PC because they just wanted that 60 FPS. Um, this is it's 60 FPS on Stadia, so um, <laughs> there is no excuse. <laughs> there is no, if Stadia does it, you can too. Yeah, uh, man, seeing that Master Chief in I thought it was I thought it was rendered at first. Yeah, I was, like, oh, wait. I was like, that looks so good. Oh, it's just the office. Yeah, <laughs> it should be interesting to see how, what they do next generation. If whether they're just going to continue developing on Destiny Two and upgrading it. Um, so Destiny also actually technically has some downgrades before its release on next gen consoles. I remember screenshots of this yeah. showing. Once again, removed parallax occlusion map. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was never on console and not on PC. It was actually in the footage of the E3 uh, conference oh, for was PlayStation 4 it this was, year. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah, see, also their relationship with Activision contributed to the unfortunate exit of Marty O'Donnell. Yeah, right. And the music you created for Destiny was so good, and I just feel like casting them aside and the way that all shook out was really unfortunate yeah i agree too. his his music is so central to bungie games yeah they're almost like if you take away the music in halo combat evolved it's decidedly not as good game <laughs> like i'm just hearing this again and i'm like oh yeah like that music it just that's it, it just that's so good for this mm -hmm. you take that away and it's just not the same i guess um people along with being downgraded in terms of that one visual aspect that i just mentioned i guess people were also disappointed in this game kind of like no man's sky where it's promising kind of a more reactive systemic That's social crazy. world in its initial showings and when they talk about it versus what the end Jason game Jones tends to oh, be oh no it's not so that no it's not as bad as no man's sky a ton no, of no, destiny no. when it came out it's, um, and it, i i played it always in online co-op and there was just always people around and things happening and it was i i never really agreed with this like there isn't enough content in destiny i feel like that that came from the type of people that play mmos where yeah they just they play for like years and they just keep going like i didn't need like a year's worth of content like i want to play a game and then when i'm done i'm done yeah and that's this provided a lot of good time yeah end game content uh, is like what you're talking this is yeah. it this is it the guy standing like, on stage i couldn't care <laughs> i could not care less about uh, that yeah man marty Wait, look at that that's great but this is oh, the, yeah, there he is. the hands it's on tall. the jeans photo i was talking about earlier john oh yeah <laughs> will allow us to do just that destiny is an ambitious and innovative game it's a perfect fit for the playstation 4 <laughs> Yeah, that is the most PR speak <laughs> I've, I've ever heard. I uh, said it like a monotone. It's beautiful. Destiny is an ambitious and large game. It is perfect for the PS4. You see that hill? You can go to it. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why you would go onto a stage just to stand there. Is it? You know, <laughs> there's no contribution there. Uh, just like, oh, I'll wave. Yeah, what, one thing I just, liked uh, when they were showing off destiny kind of before it really came out they had a lot of concept art showing it off as more like medieval fantasy vibe than the high-tech look it had later like high it kind of looks a bit more mass effecty in the end product oh i'm glad they did not do that yeah <laughs> yeah um but i think the the art direction in the final game is superb yeah uh, I wouldn't want that change. to say, we're ecstatic to bring Destiny and exclusive content to the PlayStation. What was the exclusive Man, Andrew content? House is not with them anymore, is he? I don't know. All of you who have joined us today, whether in the room or via live stream, thank you. But what you. was the exclusive content? Because technically that's something that started happening more this generation, oh, at least yeah. from the PlayStation side of things, is kind of like exclusive content DLC for a while or something like that. I don't even remember what it was exactly for Destiny. It's to bigger, better, and more immersive gameplay and a simple adaptive interface. We believe PlayStation well, 4... It. Yeah, right. It's over. Well... I, yeah, that was it. So what do you guys think? I, I think this is a way you reveal a console. Bit of tech talk at the beginning. Maybe a bit flowery in some aspects, but it shows demos and it says exactly what it does. You're playing it real-time live. That's how you demo it. And this stuff looks cool, you know? So they did it right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of the best console reveals that has ever occurred. Yeah, it's really good. Even and with I Mac. I hope that they can live up to this with the PS5 reveal. <laughs> Let's see what games they, they better, they better be looking back at this and saying, okay, what did we do right for revealing the PS4 and try to oh. recapture that? 
Yeah. I'll, I'll just go back to friction. It takes 48 minutes for them to reveal Killzone Shadow Fall. Yeah, they should have done it if, earlier. If you want to make a statement okay, about yeah. your machine, about, you know, about the next generation, and you're holding on to that content, I guess the bottom line is that you're, you're quite right. We are in the palm of their hand. There's, exactly. You know, we're going to be watching no matter what. But um, I don't know. You know, just That's as a journalist. Thing, though, you, you can do that build up and you can have people wait. You just have to have a payoff. Mm-hmm. And as long as there's a payoff, nobody will have cared in the end about that a, a, n- initial introduction because they'll be watching yeah, it anyway. Yeah, now, like, so I think it works out strategically. Like in my mind's eye, I remember like supercharged PC architecture and that little thing, and then I remember like kills on Shadowfall. That's like my mind's eye about this event. So see, I feel like when Alex first heard supercharged PC ac- uh, <laughs> architecture, his eyes rolled so far <laughs> back in his head that they fell out of his mouth. Uh, yeah, it was something like that. I was super surprised about eight gigabytes of GDDR5, though. I know that. Yeah, I think everybody was. PS4. That was a, a good choice. Good console. But yeah, I think that's it. Uh, coming holiday 2013, and that did occur. And uh, obviously, the PlayStation 4 would appear once again at E3 2013. And it had a great lead up to launch and a yeah. very successful launch. But. Obviously, this was the first taste of the current generation, but we would get another taste not too long after this with Microsoft and the Xbox One reveal, which is another one we will be looking at very soon. But I think that's going to do it for this one, as this is now over. Two hours, five minutes later. So thanks for joining me, guys. Of course there, John. No problem. And if you guys enjoyed this very long retrospective, one... Let us know in the comments if you actually made it all the way to the end. <laughs> uh, that, that's my line. That's, you know, if you did, that's awesome. Uh, and yeah, let us know if you want to see more of these as well. Like we'll be tackling Xbox soon, but this is a lot of fun to do. And it's kind of a change of pace and it makes for an interesting journey into the history of consoles. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, let us know. And of course, also uh, come find us over on Twitter, ring the notification bell. You know what to do. All the good stuff. And until next time, this is John, Richard, and Alex all signing off.